Good morning, Mr. Favorito. Good morning. Uh, just to remind you, you're still under oath. Yes, sir. Okay, please proceed. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, when we left off yesterday, Mr. Favorito, <clears throat> I think we were I just finished discussing a statement that Mr. Raffensperger had made uh, on the Today Show, and uh, and that was in the course of discussing the ba the bases or the uh, you know the things that you base your opinions on. And what I'd like you to do is to uh, pick back up with the committee and uh, talk them. Tell them about the other bases of your opinion uh, that we have not yet covered. Okay, I pick back up with the uh, the committee hearings. Well, well, no, you're the bases of the opinions that you have given thus far. The foundations of those opinions, and may the witness refer to his report for this, Your Honor. It's kind of a lengthy document. I have no objection. Excuse me. I have no objection. Okay. I have no objection. Right. You have uh, I, I do have a report here. Um, so I guess the basis of the report, if I understand the question correctly, um, you're interested in what um, evidence was available prior to January 3rd of fraud errors and irregularities. Is that correct? Yes, sir. So, um, even I think we discussed even before the election was conducted, we discussed it issues with uh, issues of the voting system and the security, the unverifiability, the fact that the United States District Court had already declared the system in violation of two Georgia laws. Um, so that was uh, some of the problems that existed prior to that. Um, we didn't talk about the uh, private money that came in that influenced the election. Why don't you tell the committee um, about that? So in Georgia was, um, prior to the election, Georgia had received approximately $45 million from the Center for Technology of Civic Life. Uh, that money was distributed uh, roughly 94% to counties that, the, um, that uh, President Biden won. So it was distributed unequally, um, which is, in from my perspective, would be a violation of equal protection and due process in both the United States and Georgia constitutions. No objection. Um, he's, not, he's not here to give legal opinions. Uh, I'm not taking it as a legal opinion. That's his his impression. Um, so, okay. So prior to the election, there were things already in place in regards to the question about uh, the questions of the machines and the um, and the, the the money the influence of private money, which has since been banned in in the state of Georgia. Um, at the time of the election and the day after and the few days after, which we're referring to as Secretary Ravenberg's comment, we were aware that there were. Um, probably upwards of uh, close to 100,000 ballots that had been added to the um, counts after the election was conducted, which had unclear sources. That turned out to be, as we talked about yesterday, more like 250,000 uh, votes, which still are not clearly accounted for and where they came from. Um, and uh, that was known as of about the first week of the, after the election. So the week of the election, November 3rd, was Tuesday. So on through that, that following week, the first week of the election, that, that was known. Um, after, um, and that was extremely well known, not just within a couple of circles. And the, on the November 14th and 15th audit, uh, we were aware uh, that was when the counterfeit ballots were detected. Um, and at that time, the um, uh, Susie Voiles and Barbara Hart, and I think four or five, six people signed sworn affidavits the following uh, night, which would have been Sunday, the, November 15th, as to the discovery of these ballots. Um, and that 
their affidavits, I believe, were submitted to the Lynn Woods uh, federal court case. Um, although I don't know that that much of anything uh, had actually happened in, in that regard. But the affidavits were submitted there. I think uh, Susie Voss testified there. So that was pretty well known at the time. Um, I had an affidavit uh, in regards to a uh, later on, um, December 3rd or so, I had an affidavit regarding the, I think we talked about the vote flip in Ware County. Uh, that occurred um, on December, uh, uh, we had released that on December 3rd. Also on December 3rd, um, there was quite a bit of other evidence uh, in regards to Coffee County that came on in December 3rd. In December 10th, when the House Government Affairs Committee um, had their hearings, uh, then the Coffee County situation became uh, in, in uh, significant light. And that was the situation which we discussed yesterday where the machines couldn't recount the right, uh, race uh, properly and they had to uh, certify the hand count. So uh, let me, I want to uh, jump in there for just a second, uh, Mr. Favorito, and go back to the uh, Center for Technology and Civic Life uh, for just a second. Yes. Um, do you know who funded that organization? Uh, yeah, that was, that was Mark Zuckerberg. And do you know who ran that organization? Uh, it was run by David uh, Plouffe. I'm not sure how you pronounce uh, that properly. Um, and uh, do you know how to spell his, that last name? Um, P L O U F F E, I believe. All right, sir. And who is David Plouf? Um, uh, my son is he was a former Obama um, um, campaign manager, um, but more importantly, probably he wrote the book that entitled The Citizen's Guide to Beating Donald Trump. All right, sir. Now, um, I interrupted you. Um, and referring to your, do you have your expert report handy? Uh, I, I have it in front of me. All right, very good. If you turn to page eight, um, and the reason I'm showing you this is that I don't, I'd be surprised if you could remember every single one of these off the top of your head. But uh, if you if you would go through those and explain to the committee uh, what they are and how they figured into your thinking. I'm sorry, you had asked me to go, to go through which? Page eight. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay, so we talked about A. We've already covered that. And beginning to B. Oh, okay, in the three hearings in regards to the Georgia General Assembly. Right. So the Georgia General Assembly held three hearings into the um, evidence of fraud, errors, and irregularities in the 2020 election. The first one was December the 3rd by the Senate uh, Judiciary Subcommittee. The second one was December the 10th by the House Government Affairs Committee. And then the third one was December 30th at the, um, that was the uh, Senate, a uh, second Senate Judiciary Subcommittee because they had had so many uh, uh, organization, so many people who needed wanted to testify and they didn't get all, everybody on. I actually got bumped from December 3rd to December 30th, and then I testified at December 10th. So um, as part of those hearings, the um, Senate Judiciary um, Subcommittee concluded on December 10th in their report that the uh, Georgia 2020 election was so riddled with fraud, systemic fraud, errors, and irregularities that it should have never been certified. All right. Um, I have on the screen now uh, a document marked Respondents Exhibit Number Forty Two. Do you my, see that? My screen's not active. Do I need to do something? Oh, do I need to power it on or something? Uh, Mr. Powers, can you? Uh, can I see on this? Sir, let's turn it on. Oh, here we go. I think I got it. Oh, we got it. Yeah, now we got it. We just need to be powered on and so. Uh, yeah, so I, I see a report. Um, and that's and the, this appears to be the report that I was referring to Yes. All right, very good. Um, have you read this report? Uh, yes, I have. And 
This uh, committee is what uh, some folks refer to as the Ligon Committee. Uh, some people I would call that. I just call it the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee. Um, All right. So yes, he, he chaired uh, William Lane um, from St. Simons in Georgia chaired that committee. Now the uh, if you look at the section there that's underlined, uh, what does that tell us? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just reading this one. Um, I can read it to you. I'm not sure if I can interpret it. Uh, were you familiar with that before I asked you to look at it? Um, I can't say specifically how familiar I was with that particular paragraph. Okay. All right. Um, now, uh, the so you, were you in the committee room during the testimony on January, on uh, December the third? Uh, yes, I was in. Um, well, let me see. I'm trying to think here. That committee room on the third was very crowded. Um. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, I was actually in a holding area as a, as a witness because I was the seventh one scheduled to testify, but then they shuffled the, the, um, the um, order. So I believe that I was in a committee, uh, a committee room, but I think we had access to a, there was a video nearby um, if we could to talk about what was, you know, see what was going on. All right, sir. Um, and uh, was the information presented at this December 3rd meeting part of your thinking uh, in the opinions you've given about whether there was evidence of fraud or irregularity? Oh, uh, absolutely. Um, for several reasons, in fact, you have up on the screen here, one was uh, Bridget Thorne's testimony. She's a senior poll manager. Uh, as well as the, the State Farm Arena video, uh, which I can talk about since I was an observer there at the State Farm Arena video. Um, in regards to Bridget Thorne, she testified that there was no control on test ballots. Um, and uh, there was a, a big concern about that at the time. We had since found that um, there, there were, in fact, um, uh, over a thousand, and I, I don't know the exact number, I have to get that for you, but uh, one or two thousand test ballots that were actually included in the certified results, several thousand in fact. I don't have the exact number with me. All right. Uh, I would like to now go back to your report and uh, keep working through the list of grounds of your opinion. Okay. Um, so I'm going back to, um, uh, well, actually, another ground for the concern there that you had on the screen was the State Farm Arena uh, situation, which I was a monitor there. Um, and and at that, that was the video that most everyone has seen where um, the uh, one of the elections officials that came out and announced that they were going to uh, discontinue counting for the evening. And the monitors hung around for a while, then they had left. Uh, and after that, the uh, ballots were pulled out of uh, uh, skirted, under, from underneath skirted tables, and then the uh, scanning resumed on the ballots without monitors present. Um, some of the concerns there uh, are, you know, and for in regards to election transparency law, uh, first of all, as, a, as someone who was in the room, the first problem is that the room is curved. So you, as an observer, were put into one corner and you cannot see around the other corner to see what was happening. That was uh, a what I would consider to be uh, a, uh, a ver adverse to election transparency law, which is um, OCGA 21246. 
The other problems uh, involved, uh, there were several things. Skirted tables are not normally allowed in a, an election ran because of the transparency law. That was a concern. Um, there would be no reason to put the ballots under a table and hide them. Another concern uh, that seems to be adverse to election transparency law in Georgia. And then uh, re after announcing that it was going to uh, stop for the evening, the county, and then picking back up, is yet um, still another violation um, of uh, a, a different statute in, in Georgia, which was 2243. So at least in my from my perspective, okay, um, not being an attorney. So those were concerns upon which my opinion was based. If that's answering your question, all right. Some, some additional concerns. Um, if, did you want me to continue yes, on I page did. nine? So um, we talked about the the massive influx of absentee ballots uh, that came in after the election uh, that actually changed the results of both the presidential race and the U.S. Senate race. Um, and that's compared to the statement that Mr. Raffensperger made on the morning of the 4th. Uh, right. It's really essentially um, corroborating uh, what he said. Uh, you know, basically, he I, I believe that he was truthful on the morning of the November 4th. And then unbeknownst to him, there were another 200,000 votes which came in and had to have come in from multiple counties without uh, his knowledge and without the the. Um, really adversarial to the pr procedures that they use. The procedures that they use, as Secretary Ransberg would know on the morning uh, uh, after the election, how many votes are left to count and how many votes were cast. And that's exactly what he said. That was exactly what we would have expected him to say. I didn't see anything unusual about that. But what was unusual is what happened afterwards, which is still, it's not unexplained. All right, sir. Um, I, we talked about my work as an observer. Um, there, uh, we, um, uh, I was, we credentialed audit monitors for a variety of counties. I served as an audit monitor in Fulton County. We talked about the fact that I was there when uh, Susie Voles and the others found the the. Um, uh, the counterfeit ballots. We talked about, I believe, the Arlo um, system and how that was inappropriately used with a broken chain of custody in the middle of the audit, uh, whereas the elections, the county elections people did not even know the results of their own audit, which is, is just, that's astounding to me. And that the results were entered unmonitored into a Secretary of State system. Secretary of State then reported the results of the audit rather than the counties reporting the results of their own audit. Uh, just based on my uh, 40 years in IT and extensive experience in auditing, that's unheard of. Uh, absolutely unheard of to have a broken chain of custody in the middle of an audit. Um, moving on to page 10. Um, and you uh, still want me to focus on things only prior to January 3rd, is that yes, correct? Sir. Um, yes, sir. That is the ruling of the chair in this case, and we must, we must abide by it. Um, I'm trying to determine most of this information that I've listed here is information that... Um, was we, what the evidence that occurred up until this that time triggered uh, a significant amount of investigations by our volunteers. And we coordinated a lot of different investigations into different things. Um, the, you know, the, the drop boxes, the surveillance video, the ballot images, all but all of these are, I believe, in, uh, in, on page 10, appear to be results of the investigations that we undertook because of the discrepancies we knew prior to January the 3rd. And why did you undertake those 
uh, investigations? Well, because there was extensive amount of fraud errors and irregularities in the in the election, it appeared to be, and the the, the Georgia uh, Senate subcommittee had testified uh, or had produced the report that the election should not have been certified, and we were getting all kinds of um, concerns coming in about different aspects of the election, which a lot of which were unrelated, but all had their um, their um, different issues, uh, the issues of the uh, Dropbox surveillance video. Um, and uh, we had already known that some of the surveillance video had been destroyed. Uh, the fact that the chain of custody forms, we knew that they were not matching up. You knew that before January 3rd? Uh, I, yeah, I, I think we knew that, but we didn't know the extent of what it was. So um, most of these things, we were aware of issues, but we were not aware of the actual magnitude of the issue until after January 3rd when we had completed our investigation. All right, sir. Well, that one goes on for quite a ways. Um, yeah, so going over to page, we talked about number 11, which was Secretary Rath, but we talked about the uh, malfunctions in Coffee County and Ware Fund uh, County on the voting system. Um, so moving to page 12. Uh, you got uh, a reference to Floyd County, Georgia in there? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, so in and Floyd, when was that known? Oh, uh, that was known right away. Uh, you're right. That was known um, in November. Um, Floyd County had uh, roughly 2,700 ballots that were stuck in adjudication um, and for reasons that we still do not know. I actually visited Floyd County, talked to two of the techs there. They could not explain it. But what they did was simply reprocess the, uh, there was an early voting location that for some reason the system could not process. And uh, the techs were never able to resolve why that happened, but the they were able to simply rerun the entire, uh, lo that location and get the correct results. And uh, at what point in the process between first machine count, hand count, and second machine count did that uh, issue come up and get resolved? Uh, I believe that was in the first machine count. I think they, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I, I'd have to go back and look to recall, but it was known that they were, uh, someone had identified they were 2,700 votes short. And I, uh, I think that that was known prior to the audit. So that would have been between, I believe, between the November election and the and the audit. Um, it, it's possible that the audit could have uncovered that, but I can't say for sure. I'd have to go back and 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 uh, take a take another look at that to make sure. You referred to the conclusion of the Ligon Committee, um, or the report of the chairman, I should say, um, that the election uh, should not have been certified. Did you agree with that? Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, there was, um, I, we've never seen the amount of fraud, errors, and irregularities that occurred in Georgia in any electronic voting uh, uh, election since I've been monitoring going back to uh, Two thousand and two. All right, keep going in your report um, and limit your limit your testimony to things that were uh, on the table before January third of twenty twenty one. Well, we talked about the conclusion here on page 12 of the committee. Um, and um, let me see. There was um, Probably much more evidence. These are the things that just come, you know, we had three days of testimony 
um, three full days of testimony at both the House Government Affairs and the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee in total. There's probably a significant amount more evidence uh, that was in there, but this was an adequate amount of evidence for me to conclude that the the election, you know, that the Ligon Committee was correct. Um, when they said the oral testimonies of witnesses on December 3rd and subsequently the written testimonies that many of us had given uh, provided ample evidence that the 2020 Georgia general election was so compromised by systemic irregularities and fraud that it should not have been certified. Um, that is, uh, just from what I have presented here is enough, uh, I think, enough evidence for me to reach that conclusion. Uh, there is more evidence that probably uh, that they have considered in those three full days of hearings, but this would I would consider to be only a highlight of what right. of what I'm telling. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm afraid I don't have a note of whether uh, R42 has been admitted. Um, if it is not, I will tender it at this point. Uh, I believe it was, but it's a, I don't think there's an objection to it. No objection. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Are you familiar with an issue uh, uh, around something called a batches loaded report in the second machine count in Fulton County? Uh, yes, I am familiar with that uh, that issue that was uncovered. Uh, it, that would have been post January third, as far as I know. But the actual uh, documents pertaining to the batches loaded report. What was their time frame? Uh, their time frame would have been December the third, I believe. The batches loaded report, um, which are from Fulton County, did not match the results that they reported to the Secretary of State's office. And then uh, another 17,000 votes um, seem to have come out of nowhere. Uh, to in order to reconcile the discrepancy that uh, they had reported to the Secretary of State's office um, a day earlier. All right, sir. And the, uh, so the, if I understand you correctly, the batches loaded report had something to do with communications between the Fulton County Elections Office and the Secretary of State's office? Uh, yes, sir. It's, it's essentially an upload of the results. Uh, and basically, Fulton, Fulton County is sending their results to the Secretary of State. All the counties do that. Um, but their results were uh, 17,000 votes short of what they were and had to go back and make some adjustments. So is this first count, second count? What is, what, where does this fit into the sequence? Um, this would have been the second count. This would have been the final count because if I recall, the Secretary of State certified the results on the 3rd or the 4th of December. And just prior to certification, or actually, it could have even been after certification, they provided the rest of the results. Um, I'd have to get the exact sequence, but um, what they had submitted was uh, in the technically through the load was not what they had reported to the office, the published results. Well, when, you, when you say what they had reported, uh, what exactly are you referring to there? Well, the published results had one number. Uh, which was, and I forget the exact number. From which, which count? Published results of which count? Oh, this, I'm sorry, the final count. The the, the machine recount, this, what we call uh, machine count two, or the recount of the election. And it was short compared to what count? Machine count two, batches loaded report, compared to what? Well, what, uh, as I believe the problem exists, is that and there's several different problems with the 17,000 votes in Fulton County. 
this particular problem was that the uh, they published there, there was a, a published result and the recount was 17,000 votes short of the previous count, machine count. So when they uploaded the load, they, they had this discrepancy and then um, they had gone back and asked their contractor to figure out what had happened because they were not, the Fulton County was had a uh, I believe a CTCL funded contractor on on site there, uh, or so they eventually uploaded another seventeen thousand votes from somewhere and, and to make the recount balance the original count. Do you know how or where they found those additional 17,000 votes? Uh, no one knows. That's also a mystery, just like the 200,000 votes that came out of nowhere um, on November 4th, 5th, and 6th. All right, Mr. Favorito, I'm going to show you a document marked <clears throat> Respondents Exhibit Number 340 and ask if you can identify that document. And before you start describing it, I want to ask you a question about when it came around. You recognize that document? Uh, I, yes, I recognize that document. That we, uh, This is one of our documents that we produced. All right. Mm -hmm. And what was the time frame in which you produced this document? I honestly cannot tell you. Uh, was there is there a date on the? I have to refer to the date on the document. I don't know when this was our forty two count. If I'm not mistaken. Oh, I'm sorry. No, this is a different document than what I was saying. Um, uh, could you could you scroll that for me one more time? Sure. And down to the bottom, I'm trying to identify. Okay, yes, I'm starting to recall this document. Uh, so this one was produced after the um, January 3rd date that you were concerned about. All right, sir. Um, the points you make looks like 12 different points in here. Mm -hmm. um, were any of these uh, known before January 3rd of 20? Uh, yes, sir. Um, num number one was known uh, before the election was even counted. Uh, um, even conducted. Number two was known before the election was conducted uh, to some degree. I don't know that we knew the exact number, but I know that Capital Research Center, um, and I forget to uh, testified at the, I believe the, De the December 3rd hearing um, in 2020 testified to number two. So that was known no later than December 3rd. Number three. Number three, three number three was known by uh, November. Mr. Uh, Chairman, this has not been admitted into evidence. Well, that's true. I, I think he's setting the predicate for for whether this. But he, is, he's he's displaying it and publishing a document that's not admitted. Well, all right, that's true. Do you want to offer the document? I'll tender uh, response three forty. And I'll object. Uh, this is. His report made after the date, he can testify about to his knowledge. I don't care if you, I don't object to him refreshing himself with it. Uh, well, wait a minute, I'll, I'll, I'll withdraw the judge. No, no objection. All right. Okay. Uh, exhibit 340 will be admitted. All right. And uh, number three. Uh, yes, that was known. Uh, we talked about that one. Was That was known by um, uh, November the... Probably 
it, well, it was known to us right away on the 14th or 15th. It was more publicly known probably about the 16th or 17th or so. All right. Was number four known before January 3rd? Yes, that was known um, on December, by December 3rd. That, that was when the video was presented to the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee. And how about number five? I don't believe that was known uh, prior to January the 3rd of, of 2021. All right, sir. So that was uh, something that came up in subsequent investigations. Uh, yes, we were we were trying to determine uh, the the problem with the seventeen thousand votes, and uh, we eventually found out that. Let me stop you there, Garland. Uh, um, excuse me, Mr. Favorito. Uh, let me stop you there. All right, uh, okay. number number six. The question then, was, yes or no, was that discovered in subsequent investigations? Yes, that's correct. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, no, it was discovered in subsequent okay. investigations. That's Thank correct. You. Thank you. And now number six, before or after January 3rd? And that would have been after January the 3rd, 2021. All right, sir. And uh, number eight? Uh, that would have been after January 3rd, 2021, I believe. Okay, sir. And uh, did I ask you about seven or eight? I meant to ask you about seven. Seven? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, yes, I, I think that was known after, I think that would have been after January 3rd. All right, and number eight, if I... But eight was after as well. It was eight before. Um, that's a good question. So it was known to it was known to us after January third. However, I believe that that was known, and I'm not sure if the number is exactly correct, but I believe that that evidence was in an expert report prior to um, January the 3rd. I think that was part of one of the cases that was filed. Um, and that's the, the issue of, so I think I could talk to that a little bit because I think that is, was known. Although I don't know that the exact number was known, but certainly that was known prior to January 3rd. So what is the nature of the issue there? The nature of the issue is that there were, uh, in this case, 86,000 voters who voted, but uh, or alleged ballots were cast for voters who voted, that and they allegedly had false uh, they had false registration dates according to the file. Well, what so, what do you mean by how do you what's so, the basis of that? So when a voter votes, you have a voter history and a and a, and a, and a registration file. And that is showing a date, a registration date. They had a registration date prior to 2017. Well, when the analysis went back and looked at the evidence uh, at the voter registration file of 2017, they were not on there. So that indicates that this, these uh, records were inserted into the file um, uh, after 2017, even though they had a, a date that was prior to 2017. So it, it, those, that appears to be, um, I think, inexplicable would be the, uh, at least the, the, the best I could say, probably there seems to be something uh, more seriously wrong uh, with uh, the record there, All right, with, sir. The, with the votes. Um, number nine, was that before or after? Uh, we were aware um, before January 3rd that a significant amount of Dropbox video surveillance had been destroyed. How were you aware of that? Um, because we had submitted open records requests for Dropbox video surveillance, and we had gotten back uh, incredible um, statements. Some said that they were destroyed. Others said it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to produce the surveillance for the Dropbox videos. 
Um, but we, so we were aware that Dropbox video surveillance was destroyed, but then through our analysis, we determined how much, uh, how much was that, um, did that represent in terms of number of ballots, which would, and we came up with that number, it represented 181,000 ballots. The number we did not know January 3rd, we did know that, that the uh, Dropbox video had been destroyed. All right, sir. And uh, number 10. Uh, same kind of situation. We knew that chain of custody forms were not correct. Prior to January 3rd, we did not know the number uh, of ballots uh, affected. So we that's why we ended up doing an investigation of these two things to determine how significant that problem really was. Were we off base or were we, and it turned out to be even more than what we thought. All right. Uh, number 11. I don't think this was known prior to January the 3rd. We knew that. Okay. that was, yeah. And then number 12, I think we've already we, talked, we've about talked about that. All right, sir. And um, what led you to put out this document, R340? Well, uh, primarily to... Uh, um, document, uh, there's a lot of misconceptions and uh, you know, news media has their own agenda, which is inconsistent with what the facts are, and at least in Georgia. So it was an effort to document all of that uh, have, um, and to have it clearly uh, that we this is what we believe, this is what our research showed, and also to make it available in, in the event that you would like to, anyone would like to use it in a in a, a proceeding like this. All right, sir. Now I'm going to show you uh, a document marked Exhibit R339. And ask if you've seen that document before. Yes, this was something that um, I, I produced with our um, we have counterparts in different states, um, the particular ba the battleground states, and in conjunction with them, I produced this document to and show that there was, in fact, significant questions of fraud errors and irregularities in other states as well as in Georgia. Now, this was this before or after uh, the things that are recounted here that you learned about, were they learned about them before or after January 3rd? Well, I, I learned about them. Uh, well, no, I can't say that. Some of these I may have learned I may have learned before January 3rd. I'd probably have to go through point by point on these. Now, I learned later than my counterparts in election integrity uh, advocates in those states. That what time they learned about them, um, I, I don't know. But some of these things were well known uh, before January 3rd, publicly well known. Okay. I'll tender uh, respondents to exhibit 339. Objection. Um, what's the basis for the objection? This, I mean, this is doesn't concern the Georgia, a lot doesn't exclusively concern the Georgia election, it concerns other elections, which I don't know where his information comes from. As he just testified, it came about after January 3. It's not something Mr. Clark would have access to. You know, he needs to refresh himself and and, and testify. I don't have any objection to that, but I don't think he this, this document should be admitted. Uh, I believe the witness testified that it was a combination of things he learned before and things that were learned after. If I heard that correctly. Okay, so that's my first of all, I mean. What the witness said is he learned, I mean, what I believe he said is that, um, you know, he learned about, he may have learned about some of these before January 3rd, others not, and he was not sure of the timeline when people did learn about this. Um, and, um, and I'm just looking at the first page of a, whatever it is, seven page document, and I have no idea what the rest of it talks about, so it's hard to rule on it. Um,
Look, um, I'll admit it for what it's worth, but it's very hard to assess that this has a whole lot of value in the context of this. So. All right, uh, Mr. Favorito on the screen there, I've got up uh, page four of this document, um, R339, and it's got a list of points about Georgia. We covered those just now uh, in exhibit R340. Uh, yes, it appears that um, all of those have been covered in the previous. Are you familiar with various statements made by the uh, Georgia Secretary of State concerning the uh, election integrity issues that were being raised at the time? Yes, very familiar. All right, I'm going to show you. Whoops. A document mark <clears throat> disciplinary council exhibit 37. See there at the bottom 37. Uh, yes, I see that exhibit. All right. Um, do you recollect this statement by the Secretary of State of Georgia, Brad Raffensperger? Uh, yes, I, I do recollect this statement. How do you react? Uh, what was your reaction at the time to this statement? Well, the reaction at the time was we were not aware that that happened. Um, since that time, <clears throat> we um, filed on the Rex request of the counties in regards to the probing the audit um, and determined that the counties confirmed that it had never happened. There was no, there was no, there was no audit in probing the uh, conducted in any of the, it was six counties that were supposed to have been conducted. And in, the first problem is, uh, and what we did know at this time is that Proving V does not conduct audits. Proving V does what they call health checks, which determines if the software running on the machine, uh, the system is the same as what it was, it should have been when it was installed. That's all Pro V and V does. They don't conduct audits. Uh, audits would prove that the count was correct. So the initial reaction was that this was um, uh, an attempt to cover the tracks that, you know, the audits were not uh, effective or appropriate, or and actually that they had been conducted, but they were not <laughs> attempt to make it look like it was successful. Um, the audits were successful, but what pro and does is they, they conduct health checks which is, it's a, it's a good thing to do, um, but it's not an audit. All right, sir. Uh, now I would like to show you Disciplinary Council Exhibit number 38 and ask if you recall this statement from the Secretary of State. Uh, yes, I do. And uh, how did you react uh, to this statement by Secretary Raffensperger? Um, not favorably. Um, the audit, as I think I've testified to already, and particularly just in looking at, we spent time in several counties, but in one county, in Fulton County alone, there's virtually no way that the audit conducted in Fulton County could have matched the original results. Um, it, it, it wasn't even close. So I would have to say that this is a false statement.
All right, now I'm showing you a document marked Disciplinary Council Exhibit number 42. Uh, I recollect this statement, yes. And uh, this statement is saying that they conducted a signature match audit in Cobb County and uh, found no meaningful errors. Uh, yes, that's what the statement says. And uh, how did you react to this statement? Well, um, there's there's a couple of issues um, here. Maybe if we could go back to the beginning, where it says that that the audit, well, first of all, it's a signature audit, it's not a count, hand count audit. It says that it found no fraudulent absentee ballots. <laughs> Under us in the current B. Raffensperger case, the state um, admitted that they had no procedure to detect illegitimate ballots. So it could not have concluded that there were no fraudulent absentee ballots. Um, that was simply, it was only a signature match. It was not a, an audit that looked at the legitimacy of the actual ballot to determine, for example, if it was on the correct paper stock, if it was marked with a, a writing instrument, if it was not folded from being mailed, um, and, uh, and those type of things. So that... It it never actually determined what he claimed that it determined in that regard. All right. And how did it come about that they went to Cobb County instead of, say, Fulton County uh, to check signatures? Well, uh, that was the uh, irony of it because the, all the questions were uh, coming uh, around Fulton County in particular. And to a lesser extent, the cab. So why they would have chosen county, Cobb County was something that baffled us because there were no, uh, no real allegations, uh, significant allegations of um, ballot trafficking or uh, ballot box stuffing or that type of thing that were coming uh, out of Cobb County. That was um, less of a concern than say, for example, Fulton County. Uh, Mr. Favorito, uh, did I ask you to form an opinion on whether further investigation of the Georgia election was warranted in the November, December timeframe in 2020? Um, you're asking me if further investigation was yeah. warranted. <clears throat> Excuse me. Absolutely. Um, I think that the evidence is clear that um, if anyone who is uh, responsible for conducting elections, when faced with all of these uh, this evidence, there would have been a duty to ensure that the results were, in fact, correct. And that did not happen in Georgia um, in 2020, or, or even subsequently for that matter, but that's outside the scope of this. Um, at the time, did you recommend further investigations? Uh, yes, we had called for a forensic audit of the machines in Ware County and Coffee County. We had uh, publicly asked for that um, because of the discrepancies. And we figured that a forensic audit would determine uh, whether or not the system was counting correctly. And we um, thought that was just common sense. However, the Secretary of State's office um, refused to conduct the forensic audit just to make sure that the system was counting correctly after it malfunctioned uh, um, in, in both counties in different ways. And Referring up to Floyd County, uh, did anybody, to your knowledge, uh, figure out why those ballots went to adjudication? The, the 2,700, I think, was the number you used. In Floyd County. Yeah, Floyd County. Uh, no, I did to talk with the technicians there in Floyd County, and they um, they could not explain that. You know, they just, they said, wait, well, 
you know, we just have to, we'll have to rerun it. And when they reran it, that, that resolves the problem. Um, so, so far we've talked about Senator Ligon calling for additional investigation and yourself calling for additional investigation. Were you two alone in doing that? Uh, no, sir. That was a, a, a public, a pre, it was a mass public outcry um, to um, do more. Uh, in fact, the House Government Affairs found uh, a lot of the same problems um, that the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee found. Uh, that was uh, simply, you know, it was a mass outcry for, um, in particular for, you know, machine um, forensic audits. Um, there were several other groups Coffee County, in fact, themselves, the Coffee County Election Board uh, requested a forensic audit of the um, of their machine, and they did not get that uh, from the Secretary of State's office. Uh, so it wasn't just the public; it was actually government officials also requesting that uh, a deeper investigation be done into several of the matters that we've we've talked about. Was there any tension or conflict between the uh, election board in Coffee County and the Secretary of State's office in this November, December timeframe? Yes, uh, significant uh, tension, of, uh, significant conflict because the Coffee County had testified to the House Government Affairs um, uh, Committee. In fact, um, one of the board members, Eric Cheney, testified immediately before I, me. Um, and he laid out the problems. He has a, a document um, that is admitted in the curling case that explains all the problems and why the Coffee County Election Board unanimously chose to, to certify their hand count, uh, which was um, uh, different than the instructions that they were given from the Secretary of State's office. The Secretary of State's office wanted them to certify the machine counts, but when the machines couldn't produce the correct results, they had no choice but to certify the hand count, which was, of course, the right thing to do. Um, so there was tension, a lot of tension, uh, dating back to December 10th, um, uh, where, uh, and in fact, the legal counsel for the Secretary of State um, un, um, <laughs> wrote a, a, a memo on December 10th uh, claiming that Mr. Cheney, the board member at that time, was given uh, false information. Uh, ironically, um, you know, the letters uh, you can, uh, they're in actually in the curling case, show that the entire board was having uh, grave concern about the, the voting system, uh, including the chairman of the board. And, uh, and they were not able to get any resolution to the problems. What was the position of the, uh, well, I'll, I'll withdraw that question. Were you ever <clears throat> contacted or interviewed by any investigators from the Secretary of State's office in the November, December timeframe? Actually, I was, yes. Tell us about that. Um, I was uh, contacted because I had submitted an affidavit of concern as an observer at the tabulation center, excuse me, I noticed that the votes were um, um, on election after midnight, there were um, votes coming in and they had an abnormal um, um, disproportionately for one candidate. In this particular case, uh, it was a presidential race and it was, um, Joe Biden's um, vote totals had gone up by about 20,000, President Biden. And at this time, um, and then President Trump had appeared to have actually gone down, which is um, not possible. Um, we've since found another case in 2022 where this happened as well. But even if they had not gone down, according to my affidavit, you know, the, a, 20, a 20 to 1 uh, ratio it just does not seem, it just it, it's not really feasible. Um, um, Fulton County's maybe, it might be 70-30, but not 20 to 1. So um, I had submitted an affidavit and the um, the investigator who called 
believe it was Inspector Braun, um, I, I started to ask me questions, and I was very um, happy that he had called me to talk about it, and I began to explain it, <clears throat> what I'd seen, and um, as we got a few questions into it, it became obvious that um, he wasn't interested in what I had uh, given him, that he was more interested in trying to entrap me with the questions uh, into saying something um, that was incorrect. And at that point in time, I just cut off the conversation and said, uh, that's um, sorry, we don't need to talk anymore. You're not, you're not interested in what I have to say. It's obvious. And uh, apart from this conversation with Inspector Braun, did you have uh, any, were you interviewed by any other representatives of the Secretary of State's office? No, that was the only time. And were you interviewed by anybody from the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, the GBI? No, I was not. Were you interviewed by anybody from the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI? I was not. Were you interviewed by anybody from the U.S. Attorney's Office in Atlanta? I was not. Were you interviewed by anybody from the Department of Justice? Uh, no, I was not. And without telling us what your subsequent investigations found, uh, well, let me withdraw that. Why did you carry out subsequent investigations? Because of, of the evidence, I think we mentioned, the evidence that uh, fraud, errors, and irregularities found early on, which was, I'm talking about December of 2020, um, warranted many, they left massive unanswered questions. And as a result, we were, um, excuse me, we had an influx of supporters who wanted answers to these questions. And they volunteered their time to try to do investigative work to figure out uh, some a lot of the questions that were that we had in do, November and December. They, they wanted answers to. So as a result of that, we began investigations, which have gone on really until this day, still um, uh, in, in attempting to clarify uh, everything that actually did happen in the 2020 uh, election and subsequent elections in Georgia 2022 as well. And has this been a, uh, a small effort or a big effort? Uh, it's been a massive effort. As I mentioned before, I work, I'm full time now uh, on this. Um, I, my wife puts a significant amount of time into it as well. And we have um, uh, statewide, we have a tremendous amount of volunteers who are you know, on call to do various things, whichever we need done to facilitate you know, some of the investigations and reports that we have done, which are uh, press conferences that we've held and and various reports that we've produced uh, over the last three years or so. And can you uh, give the committee an idea of the volume of evidence that you've collected? I, I don't even know how to begin to describe it. I mean, the, uh, in VoterGA.org, we uh, hold a press conference. We have... Um, we have um, a significant amount of evidence each time we have a press conference, we, and we have references to other documents that are not our documents that support our conclusions. Um, but I would say that we certainly have done more investigative work in the 2020 election than anyone in the entire world. In, in the Georgia election? In the Georgia election, yes. And uh, have... Have those efforts been fruitful or worthwhile? Um, it's it, it over time they have yes. Uh, we have uh, uncovered more and more things. We have presented more things to the legislature. We've gotten some success in the legislature in the last session with uh, uh, significant uh, election security improvements, um, and uh, a lot of that is based on the evidence. You know, a lot of times we will hand deliver our report to all the legislators. Uh, so uh, I would say, yes, it's been successful. And also, um, you know, other states, we share our information with other states so that they can prevent the same thing from happening in their state. And so are you looking back? Are you glad you did it? Oh, one, uh, absolutely. It's absolutely essential in order to secure the upcoming 2024 election, 
you have to understand what went wrong in 2020 and 2022 and then fix those problems in order to secure the 2024 election. All right, sir. That's all questions I have for you. Thank you very much. Mr. Fox. Um, we've marked your report as, um, you have your report in front of you, right? Yes, sir, I do. Okay. Um, you gave three opinions in that report, is that correct? Uh, yes, sir. Um, and the first one was, both before and after the November 2020 election, there were significant and insufficiently addressed or irregularities in the Dominion ballot marking device system that were widely known and widely discussed in the popular news media and especially in the election community. That was your first opinion, correct? Uh, yes, sir. And you made the many of the arguments about the deficiencies of the Dominion system in Exhibit 336, which is your September 30th, 2019 um, report, I guess, called Unresolved Security Threats for Ballot Marking Devices, correct? Um, well, that was more of a generic report on ballot marking devices in general, not necessarily specific to Dominion. It, it covered the entire uh, span on uh, the questions of, of ballot marking device systems. You did, though, uh, make presentations to SAFE, that was the Georgia Secure, Accessible, and Fair Election Commission? I did make a present presentations to the SAFE Commission. And did you discuss with SAFE the problems you saw in the Dominion system? Uh, the, the, the commission, again, you have the um, document which we can go through as to what our recommendations were. Um, our recommendations did not get into specific vendors and systems. They were just generic recommendations to here's how best to secure uh, the the election. Um, right. and, and, and your concern was with what types of uh, machines, which, which types of machines did you not think that Georgia should adopt? Well, uh, just in this particular case the, that you were referring to would be the the ballot. Uh, specifically, um, well, the uh, ballot marking device system in general, but but more specifically, I recall having a conversation with Secretary Raffensperger bef when he was still a candidate before and recommended him to avoid QR-coded voting systems. And so, and that's because verifiability had been the big issue for uh, 18 years in Georgia. And that was, the, and Dominion system was such a QR system, is that right? This particular system was. Now, right. Dominion has other systems and the vendors have other systems and other types, but we were explicitly concerned about this type of system, which is also another of the major vendors has the same type of system. Now, the SAFE, what do you call it, a committee, or what would you call it? SAFE Commission. SAFE Committee, to which you made these arguments, was co-chaired by the then Republican Secretary of State, Ms. Crittenden, right? Is it Ms. or Mrs. Rodman's uh, the first she, name? She came in at the last minute. She did not, if I recall, did not attend any meetings except for the final meeting. Which, uh, it was chaired by um, uh, Representative Fleming. Who was also a Republican. Uh, he's he's a Republican, yes, sir. And that committee deliberated for nine months. Is that correct? Uh, not really. Um, the first six months after uh, Governor Kemp set up the committee, it seemed to be almost wholly inactive. And we questioned, we, we're not aware of anything that it did. 
uh, for uh, roughly about the first six months. So the last three months was when it became more more active. It did, in fairness, hold, um, I think, four meetings um, statewide. They had four different meetings that were held, uh, and well, I, I, kind of a town hall where the public can come. They would make a presentation, the public comes and gives comments, that sort of thing. All right. Regardless of how active you think they were, the process took nine months, did it not? No, I, I wouldn't say that the process actually took nine months because I do not believe that they were active in the first six months. I think okay. the actual process, actual process time probably was no more than maybe about three, other than having the meetings, which they had. All right. In January of 2019, the committee voted by a 13 to 3 vote to replace the prior system with a ballot marking device. Uh, uh, sorry, to replace the prior system with a ballot marking device system with verifiable paper, verifiable paper ballots, correct? Uh, the, the, just so you understand the background of that, essentially. Well, let me answer my question. Let, then you uh, uh, yes, that is, that is correct. Um, but just so you understand the background, they were given the report from the Secretary of State's office at 8 o'clock that night uh, and had not had time to read it. So there was a big discussion in the meeting uh, about the fact that they, some of the uh, members felt that the report was being crammed down the throat, in particular the cybersecurity expert, who Winky Lee, Dr. Winky Lee from Georgia Tech, who was on the was on that committee. Nevertheless, I'm correct, am I not, that the you, vote was 13 to three? That's correct. All right, and that was against the position that you had taken. Um, it was, yeah, I, I guess I guess you could say that. And then in April, uh, the Republican majority legislature adopted the report, correct? Uh, they mandated um, uh, ballot marking devices. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was, so that, that was the recommendation that the safe committee had made that the Republican majority legislature adopted, correct? Yes. That's, and, that's correct. And then the new Secretary of State was Mr. Raffensperger, correct? That's correct. He is an elected Republican official, correct? Uh, yes, he is. And he was a supporter of Donald Trump in the 2020 election, was he not? <laughs> I, I don't think so. Did, uh, did he publicly he, endorse he, Mr. Trump? Uh, I don't know if he publicly endorsed him. I don't, you know, it's, it's inappropriate for a Secretary of State to endorse a candidate. I don't recall that um, him endorsing any candidate in that in that race. All right, and I wouldn't expect him to. At any rate, Mr. Raffensperger opened a competitive bidding process uh, after the legislature acted in April of was it twenty nineteen now or 20, 2019, Right? Uh, yeah, that, that is that is correct. He opened in a, a competitive bidding process, but it did not have any of our requirements in it. I see. And in July of 2019, they selected Dominion, correct? That is correct. And Dominion was then used in the November 2019 municipal elections, correct? I believe that's correct. And it was also used in 2019 mm -hmm. in two special elections, correct? My first recollection of the system being used was um, in the 2020 primaries. However, I would not dispute that if you uh, have evidence that it, there was use in the 2019 municipals, I would, I would not disagree with you. And in the 2020 primaries to which you referred, there was there were two of them. There was a presidential preference primary, correct? Um. I'm trying to recall if those were different primaries. I was thinking that in 2020, there were a single primary. Um, in 2024, there are two different primaries, but I cannot, uh, Georgia changed their, prefer, their presidential preference primary schedule uh, to make it earlier. And I can't remember if that was before 2020 or after 
um, 2020. You don't recall that there was a in 2020 there was a general primary and then there was and there was a presidential preference primary. I know there was a primary in June and it, and a runoff in August. Um, I don't recall if the presidential primary was part of June or prior to, but I would I would uh, accept whatever you your evidence is. And the Dominion systems were used for those elections, correct? Um, they would have definitely been used for the 2020 elections. Now, <clears throat> yes. nobody challenged the Dominion system until the case that was filed in front of Judge Totenberg in August of 2020, correct? No, I, no, I, I no, no, no. Formally no. challenged in the sense of, no. of bringing litigation. No, that's not true. The, the, the current, um, the current, um, uh, challenges um, from both the curling plants and the coalition plants were in 2019. Right, but the curling challenge in 2019 was to the previous system. No, no, it, sir. It was to this one. No, the, the 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 sequence of events is they challenged the previous system in 2017. Okay. And right. then in 2019, after the um, court had banned the old system. Um, and the, then they challenged, and the and the selection had been made to the new system. Okay. The Korean and coalition plan said, "Wait a minute! This system, because it's a QR coded system, is equally unverifiable as the last system." And therefore, in 2019, they challenged that. I think it was in the fall of 2019. And there was a consent order that was entered into at that time, correct? Um, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, uh, between who? Uh, between the state and uh, uh, the, the state entered into a consent order to make some changes in the election system as a result of the, the, the 2019 litigation. Um, that's possible, but I'm not aware of. All right. And then another challenge was filed in August of 2020, correct? No, there's no, there's been no additional challenge. I think you're confusing the order that Judge Totenberg made in 2020. Let's the, ch on. the challenges were from 2019. In 2020, several plaintiffs sought injunctive relief from Judge Totenberg. That was in August of 2020, correct? Uh, yeah, I, I'm. I'm not. If that was, if that's true, it's based on the 2019 challenge. The 2019 challenge is what Curling and Coalition plans made on the existing system. I I, I understand that, but my, I, but the injunctive relief that was sought was sought in August 2020 with respect to the November 20 election, 2020 elections. Correct. Uh, that that may be true. All right, and. Um, in your expert report on page six, you um, you summarize. You have a, have a paragraph there um, that in which you say Judge Totenberg October 11, 2020 order summarized compelling evidence presented by the plaintiffs. I'm sorry. Where, where are you looking? If you on page six of your report, second paragraph. You say that Judge Totenberg summarized the compelling evidence presented by the plaintiffs, that the Dominion system didn't comply with Georgia law, et cetera, correct? Uh, yes, that's what she concluded. Right. But the only relief that Judge Totenberg granted was a change in the scanner system for the processing of absentee ballots. Is that correct? Uh, that was the only relief that she could grant because we were three weeks before the election was to be conducted. It would not have been possible to change the system at that time. That's right, because the, the uh, because the challenge wasn't made until August of 2020. No, right? no, that's completely false. The, the request the challenge, for the relief the was not made. The challenge on to the system was made in 2019 very shortly after the contract was was signed. And, and there was a consent order, and then the injunctive relief was sought in August of 2020, correct? I, I can't I can't honestly tell you, um, uh, Mr. Fox, because I, I, I'm not, not an actual plaintiff in the case, and I cannot tell you when exactly injunction injunctive relief was sought, but I can tell you that the challenge was made in 2019. Okay. 
Um, well, the, the Exhibit 57 will tell us where the, when the injunctive relief is made, right? That's the order that Judge Totenberg issued. I, I don't have Exhibit 57 okay. in front of me. We, let's not worry about the quibble about the date. It's, okay. It is what it is. After the election, there was a case called Pearson v. King, which was filed in the Northern District of Georgia Federal Court uh, that challenged the accuracy of the new voting system. Pearson v. Kemp, right? Kemp, I'm sorry. I yes. Yeah. Yeah. And the governor. And the district court in that case issued a temporary restraining order to protect the data on the machines, correct? Uh, that's my recollection. Yes, sir. But the district court gave no further relief after that, did it? Um, not to my knowledge. The, the request, they had requested a forensic exam in that case, Pearson v. Kemp. And the court did not, uh, for whatever reasons, grant the request for relief to get a forensic exam on that machine. And that, that decision from the district court was appealed all the way to the Supreme Court of the United States, was it not? I'm not aware of that. Right. It's, um, you're not aware it went to the Supreme Court in December? No, I'm not aware of that case going. Now. Uh, I, I do I do recall, I believe it went to the Court of Appeals, but I don't recall it going further than that. And the Court of Appeals also granted no relief. Uh, I don't believe they did. Now, the, the Secretary of State, Republican Secretary of State, conducted extensive investigations after the election, did he not? No. I don't believe that for a minute. Uh, he, he claimed that he conducted extensive investigations. He didn't conduct even one one hundredth of the investigations that we've been conducting. So, no, I would not agree with that statement. So, you, when the Secretary of State said that he conducted investigation using law enforcement officers from his office and the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, you believe that to be a false statement? Uh, no, I believe that that the statement uh, that he claimed to investigate was correct. But you have to understand, since 2007, the Secretary of State's investigators, the, the, in the Inspector General's office was a, a Inspector General's office was set up within the Secretary of State. Since that time, the investigations have been politically motivated. And we have spent a lot of time at the legislature and grad with gradual success in getting the investigations moved away from the Secretary of State, who has his own political motive motives and agenda, and to an independent state election board with five members who are elect uh, appointed by five different entities for much more independence. So it's, it's your position that the investigations that was conducted by Secretary Raffensperger, a Republican, were politically motivated? They were superficial. And they were politically motivated. Isn't that what you just said? No, I said that the investigations were, 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 yes. So I'll explain what I mean. So, um, well, let's just confirm. Uh, well, Did you say that the investigations were politically motivated? I said that since the, in, since 2000, um, 2007, the investigations by the Secretary of State's investigators have been politically mo uh, motivated because they all report to the Secretary of State. So it's the Secretary of State's agenda, whatever his agenda is, is what, is what um, and, and, they do. And, and do you think that the Secretary of State's agenda in the fall of 2020 was to elect Joe Biden? The Secretary of State's agenda in 2020 was to have a quiet election. Right. This is the one thing that I've learned. And in 20 years of volunteer experience, uh, Mr. Fox, this is probably the most important thing I could tell you, that the elections officials, um, they don't really care. They're, they're not concerned about whether or not the right person won. What they're concerned about is to have a quiet election with no controversy. Because there's, it's, there's a lot on the line there. People can go to prison and all sorts of things in regards to elections. So what I've learned over the past 20 years is that that is the number one priority of every election official, including Secretary Ravensburg, is to have a quiet election with no controversy. And whatever they need to do to make sure that happens, that is what they will do. So Secretary Ravensburg was corrupt. That's your position. I'm saying that his. I'm, not, I'm saying that his. Um, 
agenda was to have a quiet election. Yeah. Just yeah. like every other election official. I won't say every other, but many, many officials. Um, that is their primary concern. Do you believe it was corrupt? The election? Do you believe Secretary Raffensperger was corrupt? I, I wouldn't speculate on to Secretary Raffensperger, uh, but he certainly, his handling of the 2020 election was inappropriate for any Secretary of State, and that's my opinion, okay. based on that. Now, you, we looked at Exhibit 37. Can we put up Exhibit 37, please? And we... Now, this was the press release that was issued in November on November 17, 2020, by Secretary of State Raffensperger, who had ordered this outfit called Pro V and V, which was apparently certified by the U.S. Election Assistance Commission, to do an audit of random samples of machines to confirm there was no hack or tamper. And Pro V and V found no evidence of machines being hacked or tampered, right? Um, that's what it says, but we have found that that so-called audit never actually happened. So this is the lie. The um, problem they last week ordered, right, so he ordered, um, if this is what I'm referring to, <clears throat> first of all, problem they doesn't conduct audits. They conduct health checks. And it is correct uh, part of this might be correct, but it, the, the essence of it is not correct because pro v &V, number one, doesn't conduct audits. They conduct health checks. And then number two is the open records request from the six counties that allegedly had this so-called audit show that the pro v &V never was never there. Did you testify on direct examination a moment ago that this statement was a lie? The statement is, well, we've actually submitted evidence in the Curling v. Ravensburger case that it's a false statement. So it's a, this is a lie. Well, we've again, that evidence was submitted in the case. So from the perspective of the plaintiff, Mr. Davis, and uh, uh, one of our um, supporters who actually went out and verified that the two with the six counties and got the information, and, and all of those counties returned that they went out there. No audit was conducted. So let's look at the uh, uh, Disciplinary Council Exhibit 38. This is a uh, release by Secretary Raffensperger on November 19th uh, concerning the risk-limiting audit which upheld and reaffirmed the original out reaffirmed the original outcome produced by the machine tally. And this was a full manual tally of all the votes that were cast. And he said it confirmed the original machine count. And I believe you testified on direct examination. That was a false statement, correct? Uh, it's still in this loss in, in regards to Fulton County, which we went uh, into great depth on and uh, based on our extensive analysis, which I'm glad to explain to you, um, that could not have possibly confirmed, that audit could not have possibly confirmed the original machine results. Now, this is a press release, but he attached to it the results of the audit, which are right, which you see the here, here, and here, that's what they those were, correct? Yes. All right. And, so he didn't just make this statement, he actually well, put out the audit. Well, in, in regards to the results that you're referring to, you remember that I, I testified that the audit, uh, those results were produced by the Secretary of State's office, not by the people who did the audit. You remember I testified to the broken chain of custody, and that was unheard of in my professional experience of 40 years. Uh, there's no, uh, no, there's no way you would conduct a legitimate audit and, pr and put a broken chain of custody into the middle of it. So that alone is a problem in itself, in, uh, which would invalidate the audit from any kind of reasonable uh, professional technical uh, perspective. But in addition, our analysis of the Fulton County audit specifically uh, down to the individual records uh, showed that it did not 
uh, it, it didn't act, you know, it didn't map to the original results. We actually found a 60% error rate in the um, batch uh, results, which that, I can explain to you exactly I, how we got that. I, I, I asked you a much more limited question, but you're uh, talking about your analysis of the Fulton County. Correct. All right. Now, uh, but it is your testimony that the statements made in Exhibit 38 are false. Um, yeah, I, I would test, I would say that for the reasons that I have um, explained to you, that both of these uh, press releases that you have shown me are, is in essence, false. All right. And let's look now at Exhibit 42, which you also looked back on direct. <clears throat> This is Secretary Rasberger's press statement of December 29th, 2020. I'm sorry, Emily, I'll give you a chance. I apologize. And here he says that a signature audit has again affirmed the original outcome of the November 2020 election. And he talks about this signature match audit in Cobb County, correct? Mm -hmm. Now, he explains in the third paragraph of this document why they picked Cobb County, does he not? Uh, yes. Okay. He picked it because there have been some allegations in the primary that there have been something wrong with the process in Cobb County, correct? Uh, that's, yes, that's what he's saying here. And the result of this audit was that it was 99.9% .9 accurate. 99.99% .99 accurate, sorry. Mm -hmm. So, uh, first of all, Is it, answer my question. Yes, that's, that's, I'm sorry. Yes. All right. That's what that says. And he attached a report. If you look at the uh, third page of this document, he attached the full report. He made that public, correct? Uh, yes. Yes, I believe that's true. Right. Yes. All right. Now, if you look, if we, let's go back to your report. And your second opinion which is on page eight of your report was that there was ob abundant and persuasive let me try it again since I can't seem to read today. There was abundant and persuasive evidence of election fraud and irregularity in the November 2020 presidential election in Georgia that was widely known and publicized and discussed before January 3, 2021, especially in Fulton County, Georgia. That was your second opinion, correct? Uh, if you say so, yes. Okay. Um, Incidentally, and when you were explaining all this, did I understand you to say that you thought the mail-in process was more secure than the voting machine process? No, uh, not exactly. Uh, what I testified to was that the mail-in process has issues of transparency. The ballot, what I testified to was the mail-in ballot was more secure than okay. the, than the um, in-person ballot. All right. Um, now, one of the reasons that you gave for this second opinion was the infusion, and this is again on page eight, the infusion of $45 million by Mark Zuckerberg and his wife through their Center for Technology and Civic Life, CTLCL, into Georgia elections with grants to county officials who would have to be paid back if the election process was not conducted to satisfaction of CTCL, which was run by David Booth, I think is how it's pronounced, former campaign manager for Barack Obama and a senior political advisor in his administration. Why did, it, 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 why in your, you, you told us on direct examination, you thought there was an equal protection problem here because it, it went to different counties in different amounts, mm -hmm, right. which I don't see in your statement here, but how Mr. Zuckerberg made contributions in Georgia and a number of other states mm -hmm. in the context of the uh, pandemic, 
to make sure that they had resources to conduct the 2020 election fairly, correct? No. That's not that's not my opinion. It was to interfere with the 2020 election. And so it's your opinion that this act of charity of Mr. Zuckerberg was actually an attempt to interfere with the 2020 election? Absolutely. Okay. Um, you also say on the next page that one of the, this is a, these are the facts that you're citing to support that there was election fraud. You say non-legislative changes in election procedures, especially around the processing of absentee ballots, such non-legislative changes are unconstitutional. Uh, so, you know, to give an example, the, I'm, um, I'm, I'm happy. Uh, I just want to make sure yes. that, 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 uh, yes. that's your opinion. That statement is there, yes. Okay. Uh. And um, the reason you say you, you're not a lawyer, but you think it's unconstitutional, because of what the independent state legislature th theory? Well, well, let, let's first of all, um, the outdoor drop boxes were never legislated by the legislature, and they have since been banned uh, because of the security problems they created in the 2020 election. So the sector of state overstepped his bounds and uh, delved into things that the legislative process should have. Uh, performed. And from that perspective, I would consider that to be unconstitutional as one example. I see. And 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 you, have you heard of the independent state legislature theory? The independent state legislature theory. Right. No, sir. You, you say, no, I couldn't hear you. I, no, sir, I've okay. not heard of a... You ever heard of a case from the Supreme Court called Moore v. Harper? I've heard of that case. Yeah. It rejected the independent state legislature theory, correct? I, I don't think that's true. Okay. But um, here's, here's what I, I I know that there's three, three branches of government in both the state and federal government. And I know that the Georgia legislature has banned outdoor drop boxes. They have never actually authorized them. They were installed all over the state. They created massive security problems. The video surveillance was destroyed. And that was not authorized by the legislature. And that was not something I, that, in my opinion, that the, the he had the executive authority to do. There are some things that he does that doesn't don't require legislative authority. So the fact I, that he acted, in your opinion, outside of his executive authority is evidence of fraud in the election. No, that's not what I'm saying. You know, you know that that's not exactly what I'm saying. I'm saying that it facilitates uh, fraud. And clearly, we had some degree of uh, ballots that came in uh, that were uh, not that were fraudulent ballots. Now, that was they most likely if we conduct a real investigation, the Secretary of State should have conducted, we would have probably found that those ballots came from drop, from outdoor drop boxes. It, but we it, don't know that for sure. In that Secretary of State investigation, do you know how many law enforcement officers he employed? Which investigation? The investigation he conducted after the election in all these in these allegations that you're talking about and that this Lingen committee and so forth. How many investigators? I, I have no idea if uh, if he actually, actually had any uh, Law enforcement. Uh, other than the, the the example in Cobb County, which they did have a, a GBI, um, I'm aware that they had a GBI investigator or multiple there for that signature match, uh, match, which by the way is not an audit and it doesn't confirm the results as he claimed. Uh, that they had a GBI um, investigator for that. That is the only instance I know of where a GBI investigator or was um, involved in any investigation in 2020 election. Uh, so you think the Secretary of State was uh, lying when he said he used GBI investigators to get that I, election? I think the Secretary of State overstates things in order to present himself in a good light. Actually, there was at least one other investigator that was involved, but one that came and interviewed you, right? No, he was a Secretary of State investigator. Okay. Um, yeah. 
So, How many uh, of those do you think were, were employed? Well, um, he's got um, probably, a. I can't think he's got maybe one or two dozen on staff of the Secretary of State. Uh, and in Georgia, the Secretary of State is responsible for all elections investigations. He has to request, specifically request the GBI to come in. The GBI will not uh, come in on a election investigation unless they're specifically requested by the Secretary of State. And that's the only instance that I'm aware of where he had requested an outside uh, investigator. Now, you, you cited problems with the election machines in, I think, three counties, Coffee, Ware, and Floyd, correct? In yes. yes, sir. And each of those counties went overwhelmingly for Donald Trump in the election. Isn't that true? Um, let's see, Coffee, Floyd, and Ware. Let me see if these uh, numbers yes. go. Yes. Yeah. Yes. In, that's, in, that's true. Yes, sir. In Coffee County, the it was 10,578 votes for Trump, 4,511 for Biden. That sound about right to you? Uh, I, I wouldn't dispute that. Yes, sir. And in Ware, it was initially 9,865 votes for Trump. 4,211 for Biden. After the recount, that was 9,963 for Trump and 4,169 4, for Biden, correct? Uh, I, I, I can't dispute that. I would take your, I'll take your word for that. And I won't go through the numbers, but in, in, in Floyd County, Trump got just under 70% of the vote, correct? Uh, if if you if that's the numbers you're showing, I would agree with that. And, and these are the three counties where you think there was some kind of problem with the election machines. Well, there were problems with elections uh, machines. That's not my opinion. That's that's documented fact. Um, so the implication there is here's the here's the thing. If you were to wanted to produce malware uh, to rig an election in Georgia, and you've got a single point of attack, as I testified to, all you simply do is you put a, 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 a shaving mechanism on that switches a few votes in each county, would never be detected. You could, and in a short, close race, it could change the outcome of the race. So simply, the fact that, the, that those three counties had problems is, um, doesn't really prove anything other than the fact that those three counties had problems. In Ware County, there was, uh, after the recount, there was a difference of 37 votes that were added to the Trump column, correct? Taken from Biden, added to Trump. Is that right? The hand count showed that the machine had shorted, in that particular case, Donald Trump, uh, 37 votes and given those 30 to uh, President Biden. But in, in Floyd County, 37. after the recount, Trump lost votes and Biden gained votes. Isn't that correct? Um, I, I don't know what the uh, total was. I just know that 27 votes were stuck in the um, in the adjudication for okay. reasons that the techni technicians couldn't figure out. Well, I don't know what the difference was before and after. Let me make sure we're talking about the same thing. I'm talking about Floyd County. Now. Yes, sir. Uh, and and it, isn't it a fact that the original vote for Trump in Floyd County was 29,123, and after the recount, it was 28,906. Um, I don't have those numbers, but I wouldn't dispute them if you said that they're correct. So if there was this person um, out there uh, manipulating the machines, apparently he manipulated sometimes for Biden and sometimes for Trump. Well, I'm, I'm not saying that any one person manipulated the machines, but what I'm I'm just simply testifying to the actual problems that occur that would warrant a serious forensic exam and investigation of the equipment. Um, the fact that those 27 of those got stuck, regardless of who they may have impacted, they did get stuck. Nobody knows why. The um, the the vote flip and work out very suspicious so should require a forensic exam could determine whether or not malware is on the machine likewise in coffee county the machine malfunctioned i don't know that could it could be the same thing it could have impacted um one can or the other I'm, i mean i don't know what the difference 
of the results were, but the fact is that the machine failed to count 39 votes and uh, or added 39 votes and then failed to count 185 in Coffee County. So those types of problems want a serious investigation into the election by the Secretary of State, a forensic exam. That should have been done. It wasn't done. And as a result, people do not trust the results of the election. Are you able to distinguish between evidence of the opportunity to commit fraud and evidence of actual fraud having been committed? Yes, and I believe I can. You believe you can? Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, you've testified a lot about the vulnerability of the Dominion system. Yes. But the vulnerability of the system doesn't mean, as you just told us a moment ago, that there was actual interference or hacking, right? That's correct. Okay. So that's just an opportunity to commit fraud. That's correct. Yeah. All right. So in, in the things that you've talked about today, can you list for us the ones which you believe are evidence of actual fraud having been committed? Well, um, you're referring to electronic? Um, Anything. Uh, well, I'll give you an example. As a result of our concerns expressed in the December uh, and November, we conducted, um, we did a full statewide request for ballot images from all the counties. We found out that the original ballot images in um, over about 70 counties had been destroyed, uh, in which, and in spite of the fact that they're required to be retained by for two years by federal and state law. We went in and we analyzed in Fulton County again, hate to keep going back to them, but um, we found out that the Fulton County ballot images were electronically altered before the certification of the results in 2020. Uh, that is uh, evidence of actual fraud that occurred, uh, which is still not really been properly investigated to this day. Okay, that's one. What, what else? Um, in um, regards, we've since found that there were um, at least a thousand double copied ballots in uh, Chatham County, um, and we have found, um, I think, 8,000 double scan ballots statewide, approximately. Now, that not, is not necessarily fraud. That could be errors or it could be a mixture of fraud and errors. We have no way of knowing until all that's investigated. These, but, these are things that you're, you found, you're our, 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 our organization has, has um, can, can you give some us, of these things. Can you cite us some examples of evidence of fraud uh, that is in the public record? Not something that you have uh, investigated and uncovered, but you know, any other evidence of fraud? Well, the evidence of the counterfeit ballots that we talked about earlier, um, again, these were mail-in ballots that weren't folded from being mailed. They were not uh, uh, on the correct paper stock. They were not marked with a writing instrument. They were marked with toner, according to senior poll managers who have sworn out the Davids in court cases right now. Um, so uh, that and they and they were they testified that they were marked the same way down ballot for dozens in a row. That's clear evidence of fraud okay. in the 2020 election that was known before January 3rd. In fact, it was known uh, before December 3rd. There were 100 of those ballots, correct? No one knows how many ballots were because we've spent three years in court trying to find, get those ballots public record. We uh, actually uh, appealed our case to the Georgia Supreme Court. We won the case in the Georgia Supreme Court. They declared that we had had standing all, around, all along and the Superior Court judge had made a complete error. That case went back down. He then passed it off to another judge uh, who we uh, believed was too impartial. We filed a motion to recuse. So after three years, we have still not got to see the ballots that there were six sworn affidavits for that were counterfeit. That is not the appropriate way to investigate. And the Secretary of State's office filed an amicus brief against us to try to prevent us from looking at the ballots. What kind of a Secretary of State would have done that? Corrupt one, I guess. Well, that's your opinion, not mine. Right. Um,
So um, any other evidence in the, 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 let me to go back to these ballots, the 100 ballots that, that you know about, because Ms. I'm, I'm drawing a blank on name, Voles, was that her name? Susie Voles. Voles, I apologize, uh, uh, who testified here, testified about those. Those are the ones that you know about, the 100, right? Well, uh, right, but you're assuming that there were no others in the 147,000 ballots. That just she happened to have a stack of 100 there, and she found out that those were counterfeit. The assumption in your question is that there's no other of 147,000. Those are all perfect and pristine, and yet no one has ever been able to see those to 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 know that. All right, I'm trying to find out evidence of actual fraud. Okay, the, she was given an explanation for those ballots, right? No, no one has ever given her an explanation. In fact, we tried to have her testify in Curly B. Ravensburger, uh, that just no one has ever given her a satisfactory explanation. There's been no public um, um, release of the ballot so that we can see them. It's all been a cover-up. All right, but the, 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 on pause on your word, satisfactory explanation. There was an explanation given to her as to why that these were replacement ballots, correct? No, that's not possible that they could have been replacement ballots. These were mail-in ballots. Replacement ballots would have been done on a ballot marking device, and they would have been a different type or style of ballot. So the argument, which I do believe that you're correct, some someone from the Secretary of State's office originally claimed that that was replacement ballots. That is not technically possible. Okay. So that's another example of the Secretary of State uh misstating the facts. Is that uh, yes, sir, I do believe he said that. Any, any other examples of actual fraud that you can give us? So um, uh, we talked about double double copy ballots. We talked about double scan ballots. We talked about counterfeit ballots. We talked about the voting system uh, malfunctions. Uh, and um, Now, remember, now we're just distinguishing between actual fraud and the opportunity to commit fraud. Well, so let's take the case of our county when we had the 37 vote flip. We don't know if that's fraud or if it is uh, because it was never investigated. So it appears to me, and I signed an affidavit to this, that, um, uh, that it doesn't appear to me to be an error that could be associated with what we call a ballot alignment problem. Uh, it appears to be fraud, but the truth is that you don't know for sure until you investigate and do a forensic analysis. And, and what about in Floyd County, where there was the flip that went the other way? That appeared to be fraud as well? No, I didn't say that that was fraud. I simply said that the votes got stuck. That was a malfunction of the voting system that the technicians could not explain. Any other evidence of fraud, as opposed to opportunity to commit fraud? Well, I think those are examples of potential fraud, but the other, it, you have to understand in Georgia law that the law is fraud, errors, and irregularities. So those are just, we, all we've talked about here, sorry, we haven't talked about all the other errors and irregularities that occurred as well that would justify concern over the election results in 2020. Okay. But I'm, I'm specifically asking about fraud. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... Um, the other evidence of fraud that we um, have not mentioned that I, I've already testified to is the evidence of where the 200,000 votes that came in after the election. I think I, I, we walked through this before. We said that Secretary Ravensburger on the morning of November the 4th, uh, the day after the election, uh, explained that um, 4.7 million voters had voted. He had 2% left to count, which is about 94,000 votes. They were going to be finished counting that uh, that day and that it would not change the election results. And that at that time, um, uh, Donald Trump had a 103,750 vote lead. Uh, he said, we don't guess. Um, and then the election results uh, continued to be counted for several days more, and he certified 4.998 million votes after claiming that he was uh, only 4.7 million votes had cast, and he had gotten that information from the counties. So that is an av that's evidence 
of potential fraudulent, another 200 and plus thousand ballots coming into the results after the election had been conducted. Um, you will agree with me that in the 2020 election in Georgia, there was a great increase in the amount of absentee voting over previous elections. Uh, yes, sir. And I did, I did go back and I cor uh, can correct my testimony yesterday a little bit. I think I'd said that was probably over 50%. The mail-in ballot rate was about 30%. Typically, it was normal 10%. All right. And that was a large part because of the pandemic. People didn't want to go to the polls, correct? Exactly. Yes, sir. And it's also a fact, is it not, that President Trump discouraged Republicans, voters, from voting absentee? I, I'm not really sure what President Trump may or may not have um, have said. Okay. Um, and it, it is also the case, is it not, that a lot of those absentee ballots were counted, accumulated, and came in late, correct? They should not have come in late. Uh, they, they, in Georgia, you have, um, you're allowed to scan those ballots on the third Monday before the election. So all of those ballots should have been processed. And I believe that they were processed because Secretary Ravensburger said they were on the morning of November 4th. And in fact, the, the actual certified results at that time period, um, the published results in the, in the elections uh, from the elections office said that there was only, uh, I think about a fraction of a percent left to count that all 158 and 159 counties had reported. The only outstanding county was Fulton. And that the results confirmed exactly what he told NBC Today and the American people on November 4th. And that's what his results were. So that's, um, you know, where those ballots came from is still uh, a mystery and potential. I would certainly have to say that that was potential fraud. And and I may have misspoken in the term that I use when I, that the tabulation was produced publicly late for the absentee ballots. Um, I, I think that you, you're you're probably correct. The question is why were were they still tabulating after the election when the law gave them the perfect ability to have all of that complete. And in fact, it is now the current law in Georgia that all ballot uh, tabulation has to be uh, completed on election day. But to your point, it, it did continue afterwards for reasons that we still don't know. Is it your belief that Secretary Raffensperger was involved in some kind of corrupt scheme to produce these Additional ballots? I, I wouldn't speculate on on anything. I, I I only know that I can can testify that he did allow whatever happened happened. He allowed it to happen, um, but I would not testify or could not say that he had any part of it. But the fact is that the the everything should have been counted by the end of November fourth, and which was the Wednesday after the Tuesday election, and for whatever reasons it was not and that is when um both the presidential and the senate race were changed in the next three days through those ballots now I, i'm fine with that I'm, I'm i'm shifting to another point here anyhow okay all right why don't we take a break um let's say uh Make it 15 minutes, so 13 of, I guess. All right.
ready to get started. Um, are you aware of how many lawsuits were filed either in federal or state court in Georgia challenging the results of the 2020 election? I'm aware that different lawsuits were filed for different purposes, and but I'm not aware of the number uh, that were filed. I know of a handful. Um, we've talked about one, Pearson v. Kemp, correct? Yes. And that was a challenge to the concerning the voting machines, correct? Uh, it, it they had requested um, forensic audit of several counties um, and other stuff preservation of. Yes. And then I think you mentioned earlier the Wood v. Raffensperger case. You aware of that one? Um, yes, sir. That was, yeah, Lynn Wood. Um, I think that had to do with the uh, constitutionality of the um, agreement that he had signed. Um, so, yes, I'm aware of that one. That was filed in the Northern District of Georgia, right? Federal. Yes, sir. That's my recollection. And the agreement you're talking about, the uh, consent decree that uh, Raffensperger had entered into earlier in, in connection with the curling? And, uh, uh, that's Yes, that's what they call it. It had to do with signature matching. Okay. Then there was something filed in Chatham County called In Re Enforcement of Election Laws, and the title goes on much longer. Are you aware of that one? I'm not aware of that one. Okay. Are you aware of the, the uh, another case filed in the Northern District of Georgia, Trump v. Kemp? Uh, yes, I get the Trump v. Kemp and Trump v. Ravensburger cases mixed up, but I understand there was two. Okay. But I'm aware of, I guess it's the Trump v. Ravensburger, and I, I understand there was a Trump v. Kemp case as well. So, the Trump v. Kemp case was filed in federal court, and the Trump v. Raffensburger case was filed in Fulton County Court, correct? Uh, that sounds correct to me. All right. And there was another case in Fulton County called Still v. Raffensperger. Are you aware of that one? Um, Sean Still uh, was a state senator. He's a state senator. I, I think I'm aware of that, but I'm not aware of the details. And then there was a, a third case in Fulton County called Bolin v. Raffensperger. Are you aware of that? Uh, I'm sorry, what was the plaintiff's name? Bolin, B-O-L-A-N-D. I'm not aware of that case. Okay. Of the ones that you're aware of, is it not true that every one of them was dismissed before the end of the year? Well, no, that's not true because the um, Trump v. Ravensburger case was not, um, uh, it was actually withdrawn on the 7th of January. Okay. So that one, because the election was still in dispute and um, the at that time, I think it was Senator Loeffler who had said that she would uh, object to ensure that we could have investigations. I chose not to do that. And then um, I think that case was withdrawn on the 7th without ever actually getting to any of the evidence. The efforts to get preliminary relief in that case were denied, correct? Uh, I'm, I'm really not aware about the details of the case. Okay. But if I, my numbers are right, that seven cases brought by seven plaintiffs, none of which resulted in the overturning of the 2020 election. Well, at to my knowledge, none of them even resulted in getting evidence on the record of the problems that occurred in the 2020 election. Um, I can only tell you about our case, which was you would consider that to be in, in, as one as well. And that's the, um, uh, what we call the federal of Iran. And that was uh, an equal protection due process case over the election, the, the ballot problem. And um, we were never a, allowed to put any evidence on in spite of having standing uh, awarded by the Georgia Supreme Court. So uh, I don't, you know, I feel like the what you're seeing here is that there's a reluctance, even by the judicial system uh, in in Georgia, to 
come face to face with the fraud errors and irregularities that occurred in the 2020 election. Okay. Uh, I, I frankly wasn't aware of that other uh, of the case that you were involved in. What was the name of that case again? Uh, the Fulton County counterfeit ballot case that we've discussed, and that was the one that I, uh, Federated v. Wong, which was a group of plaintiffs sued for equal protection due process because of the counterfeit ballots in the November uh, 14th audit, which I was present for. And what was the name of the defendant in that case? Um, it was the defendants were the state. Um, Just the name. The, I'm I'm sure. One, well, it 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 transferred. There's several different iterations of this because of sovereign immunity in the state of Georgia. But um, it was uh, the last iteration was Favorito v. Juan W A N, who was a an election board member. Uh, the election board has changed over there so many times. It started with a different uh, defendant, and now it's. Uh, we'll have a, a new defendant if we ever uh, get that case to, okay. to get to see the ballots. Um, Emily, could you show uh, us uh, just when I can't, I'm sorry. Um, Respondents Exhibit 42. This is a document you looked at on uh, direct examination. Um, yes, sir. The, the, how was this um, subcommittee formed, if you know? Um, I honestly don't know. I would assume that it was probably formed by the uh, chairman of the Judiciary Committee as a result of the, you know, out, the outstanding outcries of issues that occurred in the 2020 Georgia election. Which one of the, of the which ones of the uh, participants in this committee are Democrats? Um, I believe that Michael Rett and Elena Parent are. Do you know how the witnesses were selected by this, uh, sub that the subcommittee heard? Uh, I know that uh, both sides were given the opportunity to select witnesses because um, I got bumped um, as a result of one of the other um, senators who won't, had a witness that they wanted to put on. So I think that I imagine that each senator probably had to, was able to call at least one witness. Did, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no I, I, I don't know for sure, but I think that probably each senator got at least one witness and how the rest of them were determined, I don't know. The, the, um, um, the testimony lasted, I believe you said three days, is that correct? Well, there were three separate um, hearings, oh. so each one a full day. Uh, one, December 3rd, was the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee. December 10th was the House Government Affairs Committee. And then December 30th was the second um, Senate Judiciary Subcommittee. And did this subcommittee employ professional investigators? Um, I, I don't think that was its... Its scope. I'm not even sure they have the uh, authority to do that, but the scope of their um, the hearing was to accept testimony from who they believe were credible sources. Could we go to the next page, Emily? You were directed on. Uh, by Mr. MacDougall to the underlined um, statement. And that says that this report has not been formally approved by the subcommittee or the standing judiciary committee, correct? Uh, yes, that's what that says, yes. Yeah. It was submitted for informational purposes only, correct? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I can't yeah. read this. Um, the 
Yeah, so I'm sorry. What so was it, the it was submitted for informational purposes only. Well, yeah, I mean, any any subcommittee report, I guess you would say, would be for informational purposes. Now, Secretary Raffensperger looked into the allegations that were set forth in this report, did he not? No, I disagree with that. You don't agree with that? No, my, my, I, the whole issue, the whole reason we're here is because he didn't actually look into the investigations that he should have, but he claimed that he did publicly, and that claim was was uh, basically um, broadcast through the news media, leading people to believe that the election had been fully investigated in Georgia, and it absolutely positively never was. Okay. Th this claim that he investigated, that was set forth in a letter that he wrote to the uh, at least part of the Georgia congressional delegation, correct? Uh, if you're referring to his January 10th letter. January um, 6th letter is what I'm talking about. January 6th letter, yes, I'm sorry. It was a 10-page letter that he had written to the um, a couple of the Congress, um, I think the senator, probably the senator also are two congressmen and then the Georgia General Assembly, okay. yes. And, and And this letter purported to set forth the results of the investigation that he had conducted into the allegations of the Lingen group and others, correct? That's what it purported today. And Which, the investigations had been conducted before January 6th and mm -hmm. were reported on January 6th. Well, so, uh, no, so, not exactly so. So we, we refuted that letter. We filed a 42-point refutation of his 10-page letter in which we allege, I'm not sure if this was submitted to you or not, in which we allege there were 42 false statements in that 10-page letter, which he submitted to Georgia General Assembly and several uh, two U.S. Uh, Congress uh, men and then the Senator Loeffler. So uh, that's 4.2 false statements per page. All right. Well I think that was the question I asked you. The question I asked you was that this was based on investigations which he purported to have conducted before the letter was written and submitted to Congress and, and the Georgia legislature. That's what he told the, the Congress and the legislature. Can we look at Disciplinary Council Exhibit 43, please? This is a January 7th press release from Secretary Raffensperger, which attaches correspondence. Could, let's look at the second page. Uh, I'm sorry, let's look at the fourth page in. You recognize this is the letter that we've just been talking about? Yes, it is. All right. And, um, it 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 summarizes all of it, it summarizes the investigation that uh, Secretary Raffensperger conducted. Correct. Uh, it summarized the investigation that Secretary Raffensperger claimed that he conducted. Okay. <clears throat> and if we can just look at the second paragraph on the first page. Oh, sorry, I moved this into evidence. I apologize. No objection. Okay. Uh, exhibit 43 will be admitted. And the second paragraph says, and I'm, I'm going to publish this uh, first few sentences. Like you, I am disappointed in the results of the 2020 presidential election. However, my office has taken multiple steps to confirm that the result is accurate including conducting a hand audit that confirmed the results of the presidential contest, a recount requested by President Trump that also confirmed the result, an audit of voting machines that confirmed the software on the machine was accurate and not tampered with, 
and an audit of absentee ballot signatures in Cobb County that confirmed that the process was done correctly. Law enforcement officers with my office and the Georgia Bureau of Investigation have been diligently investigating all claims of fraud irregularities and continue to investigate. And I take it as your testimony that this is simply an inaccurate statement. Yes, that would be an understatement. And I'm not going to go through this entire thing, but he does go point by point in this letter through all of these allegations, does he not? Uh, yes. All right. And, and explains he... his view of why they did not affect the results of the election. That's correct. He explained his view. On page 14 of your report, you set forth your third opinion, which is based on the evidence available for January 3, 2021. There is a very strong basis for recommending further investigation and analysis of fraud and irregularity in the November 20 presidential election in Georgia. Now, you make that statement despite the Secretary of State's investigations, correct? Well, absolutely. And uh, if you want to put that back up, I can explain to you why we did that. But we basically, as I said before, when he wrote that letter, our supporters were so upset that we had produced our own study, 42-point study, refuting that letter uh, and most of which what we just talked about, I've already testified to. But um, we also put in references to our to various documents to prove that our 42-point refutation of his 10-page letter was, in fact, correct. And you make that um, statement also, despite the investigation that was conducted by the United States Attorney's Office in the Northern District of Georgia. I'm not aware of any investigation being conducted by the United States Attorney's Office. You're not aware, well, I want you to assume, because you're an expert, you can assume, um, that we've had testimony in this case that the United States Attorney's Office investigated the allegations about the State Farm Arena, and that they watched the entire state uh, tape that went on for many hours and found no evidence of any fraud. Well, I, I, of course, you may not find evidence of fraud, but you certainly have can find evidence of illegalities that are on the video, as I testified to um, earlier. Well, the procedures that we saw in that video are not in compliance with Georgia law. And you are aware that the United States Attorney was appointed by President Trump. Um, I am aware of, I think, are you talking about Mr. Pack, B.J. Pack? I can't remember. Right. Um, I'm aware that he may have been appointed by, by Mr. Trump. Okay. And um, you testified yesterday about Respondents Exhibit 18. Um, I'm sorry. It's just, you know, I got another copy of that. All right, Respondents Exhibit 18. And you cited this as evidence of a number of, would you, would you indulge me just a minute? I'm, I've done some of the piece of paper. Before. I'll do it on the fly. Um, the, the, you cited these people as very prominent experts in cybersecurity who had 
issues which they communicate to the safe commission about the uh, elections machines that were ultimately installed in, in Georgia, correct? Uh, yes, sir. All right. And you would agree that all the people that signed this letter were eminent experts in their field? Um, I cannot uh, attest to everyone on this list. I know quite a few on the list, and I oh. have no reason to doubt the others have you know, good qualifications as well as right. I found my missing exhibit. I cleverly paper clipped it to another one. Uh, I am. Um, I'm going to hand you a handwritten copy of this exhibit because I want to shift to another one. Okay. So I'm going to give you a handwritten copy of the exhibit. Uh, response 18. And now I would like you to, I would like to put up disciplinary council exhibit. Seventy-eight. Have you seen Exhibit Seventy-eight before? Um, I have never seen this exhibit before, but it was um, shown to me in the Eastman trial. But I have never seen it, nor could I was able to authenticate it. However, I, I think they were able to, they admitted it to evidence anyway. Move it into evidence. The, the court did. This wasn't on their exhibit list and wasn't provided to me. I don't see it for the first time. So here's a copy. I'm using it for impeachment purposes only. Well, actually, let, 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 let me not move it into evidence at this point. Let me, let me just, let's, let's use it for impeachment purposes. All right. You, well, let me give Mr. McDougall a chance to look at it. Sure. He, he's just handed it. Okay. Now I'm moving into evidence. Well, I'll object to coming into evidence, but uh, uh Mr. McDougal. <laughs> no, no, just you don't have to stand but get near the mic. We want to hear you. I'm gonna to object to it coming into evidence. Uh the question of the security of the Wetson machines has been a part of this case from the beginning. And he wanted to offer contrary evidence on that point, he needed to put it on his exhibit list, and this is just now coming up. And if it was an exhibit in the uh, Eastman trial, that was before exhibit lists were due in this case. So well, I think right. it was an untimely identified exhibit. <clears throat> but if he wants to use it for impeachment, to the extent it gets used for impeachment, he can, he can do that. Um, so I'll overrule the objection, but I am you know, I want to hear what the impeachment is. Okay. So so I'll allow him to ask questions based on it and then, then we'll hold an abeyance whether it's admitted. Let, let's look in at the second page of the exhibit. And I want to look at the signatures of this document and compare them to the per persons that signed uh, the Respondents Exhibit 18 that we looked at earlier. So, for example, the second person who signed this is Andrew W. Appel. I guess that's how it's pronounced, A-P-P-E-L. He also signed Respondents Exhibit 18. Is that correct? That's right, Andrew Appel. Okay. 
The fifth person is Matt Blaze, B-L-A-Z-E. He also signed Respondents Exhibit 18. I have no idea who he is. Okay. But you will agree with me that he is the person who signed both of these documents. Uh, that's what the documents show. The sixth one is Duncan Buell, B-U-E-L-L. -L. Mm -hmm. He also signed both documents, correct? Yes. Do you know, are you familiar with him? I know who he is, yes. Right. You're, incidentally, I forgot to ask you about Mr. Apple. You regard him as an expert. I think you testified on direct. Uh, he testified on the current Bay Ravensburg case. Okay. And, and what about Mr. Buell? Um, I believe he submitted a some type of a declaration. Okay. You regard him as an expert? Uh, he, he's certainly qualified, yes. Uh, number 12, Richard DeMillo, D-E capital M-I-L-L-O. Do you know him? I uh, know him well, yes. All right. And do you think highly of him? Uh, uh, yes, I do. He signed both documents, correct? Um, I, I, yes, I, I think he did. Right. Number 13, David Dill, D-I-L-L. -L. Do you know him? Um, I, yes, I think I've talked with him once before. Uh, and he signed both documents as well. Mm -hmm. If he says, I'm I'm already dead. I'm already dead. Okay. I mean, the because, both, the both. Well, I'm asking you to do that. Look at the oh, history. Yes. Of, uh, okay, I'm not, yes, I'm not refuting that. Yes, absolutely. Nope. Number 24, Harry Hursty, H U R S T I. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, I know, I know him. I mean, he signed both documents as well, did he? Mm -hmm. Number 27, Douglas W. Jones. Do you know him? I believe I do. I believe I do know him, yes. And he signed those documents mm -hmm. as well, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. And I stripped number 26, David Jefferson. Do you mm -hmm. know him? I know, I know David, yes. And he signed both documents, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. Going on to the third page of the exhibit that's on the screen, Number 37 is Peter Newman, N-E-U-M-A-N-N. -N. Do you know Mr. Newman? I don't think so. I'm sorry? I don't believe I know him. All right, but he did sign both documents, correct? Mm -hmm. If you, yeah, I'm, I'm just it, assuming that that's correct, yes. And number 39, Ronald Rivest, R-I-V-E-S-T. You know Mr. Rivest? Uh, I know who he is, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, and he signed both documents? Mm -hmm. If you, and... Right below him, number 40, Aviel, Ruben Aviel, mm -hmm. which I'm probably butchering, spelled A-V-I-E-L, Ruben, R-U-B-I-N. Yes, I know, I know him. Dr. Ruben, and uh, yes. think highly of him? Uh, yes, he's done good work. Okay, mm -hmm. he signed both documents. And the last one's number 49, Philip Stark, S-T-A-R-K. Mm -hmm. And he, yes. signed, he signed both documents. I know him, yes. Okay. Again, I want to move. Uh, oh, I've already moved in. Um, Hold on. I haven't. I, I have deferred. Do you continue to object to admitting this? Yeah, just on the uh, basis that this, Mr. Uh, this is uh, a late identified document. And, uh, you know, the election security issues were on the table a long time ago. And if he wanted to use it, he should have identified it on a timely basis. All right. I, I'm going to overrule the objection. Now, let's go back to the so documents page. admitted. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm talking over you. I apologize. This is document uh, 78. 78. Let's go back to the first page. Now, let's look at the second paragraph. Mm -hmm. These people who you've identified as experts say, we and other scientists have warned for many years that there are security weaknesses in voting systems and have advocated that election systems be better secured against malicious attack. And I'm skipping to the last sentence. However, notwithstanding these serious concerns, we have never claimed that technical vulnerabilities have actually been exploited to out alter the outcome of any US election. Do you mm -hmm. agree with that statement? Um, I think I would agree with that statement. I have to think about that a little bit longer, but I 
don't look, nothing jumps out at me. Um, I think that they have provided evidence that, that vulnerabilities could have been exploited, but they have not actually claimed. I think that would be a true state. Let's look at the next pair. Anyone asserting that a U.S. election was rigged is making an extraordinary claim, one that must be supported by persuasive and verifiable evidence. Merely citing the existence of technical flaws does not establish that an attack occurred, much less that it altered an election outcome. It's simply speculation. Do you agree with that statement? Uh, yes, and we've testified to that already, that vulnerability, there's a difference between vulnerabilities and actual fraud, and I think we've talked about that at length. Okay, and then let's skip down to the two paragraphs below that. One begins with, we are aware. says, we are aware of alarming assertions being made that the 2020 election was rigged by exploiting technical vulnerabilities. However, in every case of which we are aware, these claims either have been unsubstantiated or are technically incoherent. To our collective knowledge, no credible evidence has been put forth that supports the conclusion that the 2020 election outcome in any state has been altered through technical compromise. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that statement? Um, do I agree with the statement? Uh, I mean, I don't have firsthand knowledge of what they are aware of and what they were not aware of. I can tell you that none of them have contacted me at the time that this was written. So you don't agree with that statement? No, I'm not saying that I disagree with the statement. It might be to their collective knowledge that there was no credible evidence that was put forth about the 2020 election at the time that this was written. Um, so I'm not disagreeing with their statement per se. Okay. And just one final point, if we go up to the top of the page. The time it was written was November of 2020, correct? Right? Well, and that's the key factor here. The time that it was written, there was very little credible evidence of the, of this, uh, the election. This was dated November 16th. The uh, Ware County vote flip had not been identified till December 3rd. The Coffee County uh, malfunctions had not been identified till December 10th. The um, counterfeit ballots were not identified at this time because the, that didn't become public until for a couple of days after this. So for people who are outside of Georgia to say that there was no uh, evidence, uh, significant evidence um, that uh, fraud or certainly a, or a rigged election, I think is, is accurate. I mean, there was little or no evidence of an election being rigged. In fact, I've never even claimed that the election was rigged. If you recall, we've been testifying for you know, a day and a half, never have claimed that. So in number one, uh, I would agree with them on that. But number two, the most important thing is that you have to uh, take this whole letter in context with the date and time that it was written. And the date and time that it was written, uh, there was only the question of where did the uh, outstanding ballots come from. We've raised that issue. That is not directly related to the voting system. So there's two types of fraud we talked about, and primarily... One is the ballot stuffing, ballot trafficking, which is not necessarily. Your, your camera's not on yet, so. Excuse yeah. me. Here, I'll get that. Yeah. Okay. Excuse me. Who is speaking over this line? I just muted them. Okay, thank you. That sounded like uh, my co counsel who's on the remote, if I can recognize the voice. Oh, okay. All right. Um, so I'm sorry, I forgot where I was. Well, let, but, let me see. But, let me... Just to recap, there are two types of, of fraud that we talked about. We talked about voting potential voting system fraud, and we talked about mail-in or absentee ballot type of fraud. At this point in time, there was little evidence uh, of any that there was any type of problem with the electronic voting system. 
as of November 16th. The evidence was only beginning to develop as of to the ballot trafficking that was going on, as well as the um, possible stuffing of the ballot boxes. So that I don't see a necessarily the same um, conflict that you're seeing with what they're saying uh, as of this day and what I am saying today. And this doesn't, this is only, uh, document only addresses uh, technology issues, correct? Exactly. All right. And with respect to the technology issues, you're saying that after this date, the evidence of the technology issues were the, well, the counterfeit, what you call the counterfeit ballots have already been identified, correct? They were identified. The counterfeit the ballots were originally identified on the 14th, but it was not public knowledge. Oh. Now, we're talking about people from all over the country. So, they would have had no way to know what we identified on the 14th because they were not present at the State Farm Arena, uh, it, with the possible exception of maybe one. Okay. I was asking a slightly different question. The 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 technological fraud that you've identified in Georgia are the counterfeit ballots, which you call the counterfeit ballots, the change of 37 votes in Ware County, and... I think that was it, right? The the machine malfunctions in Coffee County. Oh, and you think and, the malfunctions are evidence of fraud? Um, at, at, right, and we talked about Floyd County as well. Okay. So at, just to give you the sequence of time here, the only thing that was possible they could have known at that time would have been the Floyd County 2,700 votes. And I've, as I've testified to, that was just simply a matter of them getting stuck in the adjudication process. That's not any evidence of rigging or so on. The evidence of the malfunctions, as I testified to, came on December 3rd, where County, December 10th, Coffee County, which they would have no knowledge of on November 16th when they, when they did this report. And the counterfeit ballots, which could also... Um, uh, lead to the fact that the system has you know, accepts duplicates, that was not known to them on the 16th when they released this document either because it had not become public. It was only being put in the Glenwood's court case. Okay. So that's my right. take on and, this. Topic. But it is also <laughs> your opinion that there's no evidence that the election was rigged. Uh, I would say, well, let me, let me, we, let me say that. There is evidence, we have produced evidence that the Fulton County ballot images were electronically altered prior to certification of the 2020 results. We did not have that evidence fully developed by January the 3rd of 2021. Okay. Thank you. Any redirect? Excuse me one, one second, Mr. McDougall. At least on, on screen, I'm seeing Mr. Meese, um, and I understand you're offering him as an expert, but is there a reason why he should be on screen now? I don't think so, not right now. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure whether that's something that could be uh, adjusted, but I think he ought to be in the waiting room although he can watch the proceeding, right? Okay, you ready for me? Just to be clear, if he's in the waiting room, he cannot view the proceedings. Oh, and he did just hide, he did just hide his camera. So. Oh, okay. All right, fine. Thanks. I didn't want people to think he was in yeah. the courtroom or 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 something. Obviously, if he's watching, he can watch. But I didn't want to. You know, people are looking at this. So. Right, okay. Thank you. Um, may I proceed? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Favorito. I'm, mark, I'm showing you on the screen a document marked Respondents 337, 
Can you identify that document? Yes, that's the document that I just testified to a minute ago um, when we were talking about the refutation of Secretary Raffensperger's letter to the Georgia General Assembly and uh, members of the U.S. Congress. And this uh, goes through the points that you were referring to earlier. Uh, yes, sir. We did a point by point refutation of that pin page letter. And we came up with 42 points where we considered to be false or deceptive statements. I tend to respondents 337 into evidence. No objection. All right. It will be admitted. Are there any points in this <clears throat> reputation document uh, that you would like to cover that we have not covered so far? Well, um, I see number one there. I'll, I'll just, just to be briefly, we talked about the audit, um, the Fulton County audit. But, and I um, argued that the audit was, did not match the results of the original. And our, um, evidence was in fact included in Governor Kemp's own 36-point report of the audit. And he, uh, based on the evidence that we had uh, presented, uh, had turned uh, that evidence, as well as a couple of his own points, over to the State Election Board for further investigation. And some of the things that we found in that audit, and this was it was after January 3rd, was the fact that it had a 60% batch error rate. And by that, I mean that when you add up the totals for a batch, presidential totals, uh, President Trump, President Biden, uh, Joe Jorgensen was a libertarian candidate, 60% um, of the time, the, the results did not match what the ballot images showed that we had gotten through, through discovery. Uh, so that was uh, a concern. We found uh, a couple hold, of... Hold on just a second there, Mr. Favorito. Uh, you're saying that the tally sheet or recap sheet on the batch totals did not match what the ballots themselves showed in the what, uh, hand what, count? What the ballot images showed, which were hand counted, correct. And the there figures some... that were entered into the Arlo system during the hand recount, are there, where are they taken from? They're taken from the tally sheets. Okay. All right. Go ahead. And uh, we also found falsified tally sheets. Um, there were um, seven falsified tally sheets that showed uh, that a batch was uh, 100 to nothing for uh, President Biden, 200 to nothing, 150 to nothing, which is, you know, it's a technical impossibility. Um, that uh, we found a couple hundred duplicate scan ballots that had been... before you leave the oh. falsified tally sheets. Mm -hmm. uh, are you saying the numbers on the tally sheet were just false compared to the to the actual ballots in the batch? That's correct. We found that the ballot um, images and looking at the ballot images for that batch would show, say, a sixty forty ratio. Let's say sixty. Um, we'll say if there's 100, uh, 100 votes, it'd be 60 votes for President Biden, 40, vo voice, uh, 40 votes for former President Trump. But when you looked at the actual, uh, that's what the image would show, but the tally sheet for those images showed it was 100 to nothing. So the tally sheet was clearly falsified, but yet that was included in the, in the audit that um, Secretary Ravensburger said match the original results. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, uh, all right. So, uh, 200 duplicate scanned ballots? Yes. Uh, there were, um, we found, and that number has just mushroomed since then. This was originally we found way back then. Um, there was 200 duplicate scanned ballots. I think actually we, and we, that number went to 375. We now, as of today, have found uh, 8,000 ballots that were duplicately scanned and reported into the results of the 2020 election. And when you say duplicate, duplicately scanned. Yeah, double scanned. 
is it would be we'll a better scan, same ballot scan same, twice. Same, same ballot scanned twice. All right, sir. And then mm -hmm. what's your next bullet point there? There were 4,000 uh, double reported ballots, not to be confused with double scan ballots. So the difference is that a double reported ballot is it's reported twice on the, um, the audit results. But there, so over 4,000 were doubly reported. So it's not possible that the audit results could have matched the original results with these types of errors that we uncovered. Well, if you take out all of this, uh, like the 4,000 duplicate reported ballots and the multiply scanned ballots uh, from the audit count, the hand audit count, uh, is the hand audit count short compared to the first machine count? Um, if you took those off, I would say yes, the hand audit count would be short. In fact, we found that there were 17,000 votes for which there were no ballot images um, in, in the results. And in the Curling v. Ravensburger case, Dr. Stark also confirmed that same finding of over 17,000 certified votes that had no ballot images. He called them cast vote records. A cast vote record is tabulated into a certified uh, vote, as I testified to. So he found 17,000 cast vote records that had no ballot images. We found that 17,000 certified votes that had no, no ballot images. What well, is Dr. Stark, yes, ma'am. Is it a matter of concern that there would be, and well, let me withdraw that. Is that was that statewide or in one county, the 17,000? Uh, in 17,000, it was only, that was Fulton County alone. All right, sir. And is it a matter of concern from an election integrity standpoint that there would be seven over 17,000 votes for which there was no ballot image? Well, absolutely, because um, that means that the votes uh, are probably not valid and the margin of victory in the presidential race was only 11,779 votes. And the uh, U.S. Senate race was only slightly more than that. Why does the absence of a ballot image to correspond to those votes indicate anything one way or the other? Uh, because a ballot image, I think I testified to this yesterday, but a ballot image is necessary to create a cast vote record. And the cast vote record is what is accumulated to the election results. So uh, the you can't have a, a vote if you don't have a ballot image that has that vote on it. So it's, it's not technically possible to have more votes than ballot images. Uh, it's like creating votes out of thin air. And so there are 17,000 and uh, I think our number was 724, 17,000, over 17,000 votes that have no ballot image and thus they have no original source justification uh, for even existing. All right, um, on your screen, I have point number eight. And, uh, You've just covered the ballot images. That's the second bullet point. Uh, what is the third bill, bullet point about? Um, the uh, yeah, those were the voters that voted from a, a vacant address, and I cannot. Um, I don't think I can give you much detail on that. Um, but while we're here, I did want to mention that these sworn affidavits we talked about were only one hundred ballots that were seen, but they. They, the one of the affidavits, the affiant believed that there could have been thousands more because she had only seen such a small sample. So just wanted to mention that. 
All right, sir. And I believe you talked yesterday about the uh, chain of custody for Dropbox balance. Yes, sir. All right. Um, All right, number 13. Uh, we were just looking at defendant's uh, exhibit, excuse me, disciplinary counsel's exhibit number 78, which was the uh, November 16th, 2020 letter that was signed by, among others, uh, Alex Halderman and Harry Hursty, uh, that they had not found any, or not aware of any electronic uh, manipulation of the votes or computer hacking of the votes. Um, but you're making reference to testimony they gave or demonstrations they made in the curling case there? Uh, yes. Um, um, for example, Dr. Haldeman literally hacked the voting system in front of the United States District Court for the second time in January of 2024. Were you, been, in, were you in the courtroom for that? I was. Yes, sir. And uh, I was also in the courtroom for the first time, and um, the Secretary of State has taken no precaution since then to ensure that, I mean, it, that that's not possible. In fact, the testimony showed that no one in the Secretary of State's office is responsible for cybersecurity of the voting system. Um, the Chief Operating Officer, Gabriel Sterling, said that he believed the Deputy Director, Michael Barnes, was responsible. Deputy Director Barnes said that he believed the Chief Technology Officer was responsible, uh, Merritt Beaver. Merritt Beaver said he was not responsible for Dominion cybersecurity, that it was under the purview of Gabriel Sterling, the Chief Operating Officer. So they all made a circle, pointing the fingers at each other. No one was responsible for cybersecurity to protect our votes in the state of Georgia. The um, chief technology officer also mentioned that they had outsourced that responsibility to Dominion. No one from Dominion testified. And in fairness to Dominion, they could not perform cybersecurity for the Secretary of State's office. They can only perform cybersecurity for their own election system. And as we testified before, I yesterday I explained that the, um, the system is programmed centrally from the Secretary of State's office. And they would have to be responsible for that side of security. That's uh, over and above what Dominion voting systems would be able to do. All right, sir. And on your screen now is uh, item number 17. And uh, what do you say in there? This is this goes to the uh, issue of the um, Secretary Ravensburger's press release where he claimed that ProVNV had conducted an audit of the um, um, no, in November of 2020, uh, he alleged in the press release, or at least he implied in the press release, that it was a statewide audit. It was not, it was only six counties. And as I testified for, and this explains that, that the um, only six counties were audited. Um, and in fact, he only claimed that six counties were audited. In reality, we retrieved the from open records request um, where it asked for any audit results from those six counties that he claimed was audited. And in fact, they had they uh, confirmed that no ProVNV had, had not been there ever. And as well from our own explanation, they wouldn't have been able to do an audit anyway. They could have only done a health check. So not only did they not do conduct, conduct an audit, but they also never showed up at those six counties, All right. according to the counties. All right. Well, you know, this goes on for quite a few more pages. Um, and I, is it fair to say that the other points are equally strong as the one we've covered? Yeah, I think it's fair to say. Um, the, the only thing that I could add would be um, in regards to the Cobb County situation, the signature matching, which I'm not sure is in here or not. Uh, I believe it is in here, but that was signature matching. It was not an audit. They only matched the envelopes against the um, the signatures on file. Uh, and what we were fascinated with as to why they had selected Cobb, uh, Cobb County, I know that we testified his explanation as to why it was in his press release, 
But at that point in time, all the questions were coming from about Fulton County and the signature matching and the lower rejection rate there, uh, uh, extraordinarily low rate. And that is what uh, we were concerned about. And it turned out later, as I think I testified yesterday, that signature matching was never done in Fulton County at all. Uh, so uh, it's ironic that, that he had picked Cobb County when he had the opportunity to pick, um, uh, based on some previous uh, results, he had the opportunity to pick Fulton County where the problems were in the November 2020 election, which he chose not to do. Well, Your Honor, and, rather, uh, Mr. Chairman, rather than uh, go through each of these 42 points, uh, I'd be content to stop here and uh, have a lunch break unless Mr. Fox has recross. Well. Okay. Do you have any recross? No. Okay. Does the panel have any questions? No, I actually do. Okay. Ms. Matthews. Um, thank you, Mr. Fabrini. When you testified prior to the break, Mr. McDonald asked if you were contacted by any federal agency or the FBI regarding the audit, and you said no, right? That's correct. Thank you, Mr. McDonald. I apologize. I, it's McDougal, not McDonald. Quite all right. Thank you. Thank you. Did you or members of your group consider contacting the FBI yourselves? Well, in, in Georgia, as I've testified earlier, all elections are, are under the purview of the Secretary of State's office. I understand that. So we did not consider, um, I don't believe we considered um, going outside the bounds of what the law requires, which would have been for us to present that to the Secretary of State's office, who we know was not amenable to investigating uh, any fraud errors or irregularities. So you did not contact anyone in the U.S. Congress. In the U.S. Congress. Um, I, I may have contacted um, um, some either General Assembly members or U.S. Congress members about what we had found. I think I may have done that. Did you or members of your group contact anyone in the Georgia Republican Party? Not that I'm aware of. Did you or members of your group contact Mr. Clark? No, I don't even know. I don't know who Mr. Clark it was. Or I still don't even know. So no, we did not. You don't know who Mr. Clark is? I mean, I know now, but I didn't know. I did not know who Mr. Clark was at that time. Did you know have or have reason to speak with him before January 3rd? Uh, no, no, I, I had no reason to speak with him. Or members of your group? As far as I know, none of the members of that group knew Mr. Clark at that time. Thank you. I have no additional questions. Does that stimulate any questions? Not me. No, thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Well, why don't we take our lunch break? Um, Long-awaited lunch break. <laughs> we have two seconds on schedule before we do that. Sure. Um, according to what we were told yesterday, the lineup is Mr. Meese, Mr. Hari, Ms. Honey, and I think Mr. Schaefer. Schaefer's been on the list all the time. Uh, we got an um, expert report from Mr. Meese about, uh, I didn't see it till I got out of court yesterday, but I, got, I saw it. I'm prepared to cross-examine Mr. Meese. Mr. Hardy's expert report was sent to us after midnight last night. I've been able to read it hurriedly once this morning. I am not prepared to cross-examine him. Um, and I still have no information about Ms. Honey other than what we've been try to pick up on the internet, which isn't much. Um, and I still don't understand uh, why this witness is being sprung on us at the last moment. Um, so that, you know, 
Meese and Schaefer, we don't have any objection to going forward with, but um, we do object to the others, particularly Hari. I have not, I, you know, I'm completely unprepared. Sorry to interrupt. Do you want to excuse the witness first? Um, yeah, we can do that. Thank you very much, Ms. Barasas. Um, thank you very much for your time, Mr. Favorito. I really appreciate it. You're excused, and actually, you can get lunch. So. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. I would add one other point with respect to Mr. Hari. It looks to me like Although, to be fair to counsel, it wasn't in the uh, form that he asked for uh, of, of a Rule 26 report. Uh, so, to be fair to him, if he wanted to have more time to cross him, uh, we would not object to that. As far as the to, whether it's going to be duplicative, um, there is some overlap in what he knows, but I plan to focus him on different elements of that that have not previously been testified to by other witnesses. Um, where are we in, you, I had asked you last week sort of what you were anticipating and you had said, and I, I'm not, you know, I'm not holding you to this as some, you know, written in blog, but it has some idea of scheduling that you thought you'd be able to finish your case on, by Wednesday. Is that still true? I think that's still true, Mr. Hirsch. Um, the, uh, you know, it depends on how long he takes with Mr. Smith on cross. Mm -hmm. I would uh, estimate that, well, I mean, it's easy for me to say, uh, since I'm not doing the cross, but he could probably get the cross of, uh, Smith and Hari done Wednesday afternoon. And um, so our remaining witnesses are uh, Meese, Schaefer, Hari, and Honey. And then there is one uh, one point that I've discussed with Mr. Fox without resolution, uh, which is we would like to put in evidence that there's not been any similar case to this in the past, that no other non-federal lawyer has been charged on comparable charges. Um, we propose the stipulation uh, to establish that it was declined. And so uh, we would like to call a witness to speak for the Office of Disciplinary Counsel uh, to ask him those questions. I propose that uh, we call him. Uh, he vigorously objected. We met about this last week and he very vigorously objected to that. Uh, we'd be willing to take somebody else who could authoritatively speak to that. Uh, but if we can't resolve it, then we would we will call him and uh, there will have to be a ruling one way or the other. And the examination will be very, very short. Uh, Mr. Uh, Burnham would conduct that examination, and we'd be willing to show the chair the questions that we plan to ask. Okay. Look, I, I will take up that objection separately um, on that. Um, is it possible to to handle it? Is it how's the name spelled, uh, Mr. Hori? H A U R Y. His first name, uh, like mine. Okay. So it's so so it's Harry Hori. Harry Hori. Okay. He had parents with even more imagination than mine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um is it possible to handle that testimony in the same way that we're handling Mr. Smith's testimony? I, I would think so. Huh. Uh and if it's acceptable to the committee and to Mr. Fox. Okay. And 
do you have enough to fill the rest of today regardless? Well, that is uh, without the cross, we may we may not get to five. So I, mean, I just want to try to use our time efficiently. Uh, yes. Are there any documents that we need to discuss or other housekeeping things that need to be done? I don't think I have a lot of exhibits for, for Mr. Hari. Um, I do have some exhibits for Ms. Honey. Um, so, you know, for direct and cross, we would have me and Honey. Now, these both Schaefer and Hari have appointments this afternoon that sort of conflict with our schedules. There's a little bit of juggling on my end there to try to get them up uh -huh. and down without conflicting with their appointments. And I don't quite know the exact answer to that yet. Okay. All right. Well, let's plow ahead. Um, I think, and take up your request to examine witnesses from from ODC, um, and uh, let's break for lunch. Um, come back at two. Yeah. All right, we're in recess.
Ready, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, I just have one housekeeping thing before we get started um, with Mr. Meese. Um, before the break, Mr. McDougall, you raised the possibility of calling disciplinary counsel or someone else, and you indicated that uh, Mr. Fox objected to it. I wanted to give Mr. Fox an opportunity to make his objection. Well, it's twofold. First, I don't think it's proper to call opposing counsel in, in a case you're not supposed to be testifying in a case in which you're the lawyer. But secondly, what they're really looking for is expert testimony. Well, second point is they're looking for testimony about what I think is a non-issue. They have this interpretation of uh, the McDade Act and the uh, regulations there on which uh, they say if you have never um, prosecuted anyone else for the kind of conduct that you're prosecuting somebody who is a government lawyer, you can't prosecute the government lawyer. I don't think that's what the language they're talking about refers to. I think what the language they're talking about says, in essence, is that the same rules that apply to all other lawyers who are members of the bar also apply to government lawyers. That is, you can't have a special rule, um, disciplinary rule, that applies just to government lawyers. So I think the second point is it's really not, at best, it's a legal issue, and it's a legal issue which I don't think they uh, have any uh, merit. I mean, they, they haven't been able to prevail on that issue either in the Court of Appeals here uh, or the United States District Court across the street. And of course, there's still a pending appeal uh, over there. But so far, they've lost in that. And then the third point is that even assuming that were the proper subject of testimony, it would be the proper subject of expert testimony. Because what they're really asking is for somebody who has experience in the case law of the District of Columbia with respect to disciplinary matters to survey um, those disciplinary matters and give them the opinion uh, that they want or the finding that they want uh, that, uh, that nobody has ever been prosecuted for precisely this sort of thing before or wherever they would phrase it. And if that is the proper subject of uh, evidence in this proceeding, it's the proper subject of um, expert evidence. And uh, they don't get to convert me uh, or anybody in my office uh, to be their expert. There are plenty of people in the District of Columbia, um, allegedly I had one on the stand earlier, who are expert in the um, uh, rules of professional responsibility in the case law of the uh, Court of Appeals who could uh, be retained to uh, give an opinion on that. So those are the three grounds of my objection. So in, in response, uh, Number one, we have been making this jurisdictional uh, argument uh, from the beginning. We think these are jurisdictional facts in order to satisfy the threshold jurisdictional requirement under uh, 28.530B and 28 CFR 77.2. And the purpose of that uh, is to prevent federal lawyers from being uh, singled out and effectively persecuted by a hostile uh, local jurisdiction. And in that sense, the policy is animated by the same concerns that are behind the federal officer removal statute, uh, which, as we all know, in certain parts of the country, the policies of the federal government are very unpopular. And so uh, there has been a historical concern, amply documented historically, uh, that local officials would be hostile to federal officers. So, um, and for many, many years until the McDade Act, the Department of Justice's position was there was no jurisdiction whatsoever because of federal supremacy. So this is a uh, important jurisdictional fact. I, I uh, don't believe that it's a matter of expert opinion testimony because the question is a point of fact. Has there been a case like this before? Uh, as to a non-federal lawyer. Is this something that is ordinarily done to non-federal lawyers? And, you know, we believe the answer to that is no. And that's the that's what we're trying to establish factually. Now, 
you could take the position that that's a fact they had to prove and they didn't put in any evidence on that and therefore they failed to prove an essential element of their case. But as long as we're here, uh, we would like to get positive testimony uh, on that fact. And then uh, even if Mr. Chairman is not impressed with our argument about how those statutes work, uh, perhaps a, an appellate court would be someday. And so we would like to get that evidence in. And, you know, the, um, uh, the point about putting your opposing counsel on the stand, there, there's something to that. And it, it's obviously there's a risk that it could get more adversarial than it ought to be. Well, Mr. Burnham is going to ask the questions um, and it's going to be very short. It's one page of questions. It's just to get at uh, the facts that we we contend there's never been a case like this. And we offered to stipulate. We offered a we offered a stipulation to avoid the necessity of putting Mr. Fox on the stand or anybody from his office or anybody from the bar about that. But um, that was declined, and so our remedy is to is to call one of them. And so that's that's where we are. Okay. Um... I'm going to sustain the objection. Um, I'm not barring you from arguing the points that you want to make in your brief and arguing that you're unaware of any case and challenging disciplinary counsel to say you're wrong. Um, but I don't think it's necessary to have the testimony, and I don't think it's really relevant for other reasons. So I'm going to sustain the objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. All right. Are we ready to call Mr. Meese? Yes, I see that he's already here. Um, hello, Mr. Meese. Um, my name is Meryl Hirsch. Um, I am the hearing committee chair for this hearing, and I'm going to swear you in. Do you want to swear or affirm the truth of your testimony? Can you hear me? Should ask that question first. Mr. Meese? Yes. Ah. Uh, can you hear me, I guess? Yes, I can. I am the can chair. Me already? Yes, I can hear you now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do you want to swear or affirm the truth of the testimony? I, I, will, I will swear it's true. Okay. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you are going to give in this proceeding will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God? I do. All right. Thank you very much. Could you please state your full name for the record? Edwin Meese the third. Thank you. Um, please proceed, Mr. Burnham. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, General Meese, thank you for joining us today. Can you please start your testimony by offering the committee a summary of your professional background as a lawyer with a special emphasis upon any service in the Department of Justice? Okay, I have been a lawyer uh, since uh, 1959 and uh, been a member of the bar of the state of California, as well as the federal bar for the of the United States Supreme Court and the uh, district court, or rather the uh, circuit court for the Ninth District of the Ninth Circuit. I have uh, practiced law in private practice. I have practiced as a deputy district attorney. I have been the legal advisor to the governor of California. And I have been uh, first the uh, president's counsel, um, that is the counselor to the president of the United States. And then as the, uh, the attorney general of the United States, I'm now a practicing, uh, or rather uh, a law, a member of the state bar of California. And can you share with the committee which president you served under as attorney general and what were the dates during which you served? Yes, I served as uh, as uh, attorney general of the United States under President Reagan, beginning my service in that position in February of 1985 and concluding in August of uh, 19, uh, uh, let's see, 85, uh, 1988. 
And have you ever uh, taught classes or otherwise been involved in, in academia and education on the subjects of constitutional law or the functioning of the Department of Justice? Uh, yes, I was a professor at the University of San Diego. I also taught at uh, for uh, some time as a uh, adjunct professor at the University of California School of Law at Berkeley. I've also uh, lectured at numerous law schools all over the country. And finally, as to your experience, General Meese, have you written books, articles, or other publications on the subjects, again, of constitutional law or on the functioning of the United States Department of Justice? Uh, yes, I have I've written many articles and many of my speeches were turned into articles on uh, matters pertaining to uh, the uh, the Department of Justice and uh, and uh, uh, legal legal matters, including uh, constitutional law. Mr. Chairman, we offer to the committee the witness as an expert in the areas of constitutional law and the functioning of the United States Department of Justice, and invite opposing counsel to voir dire if they wish. I'm certainly willing to accept this witness's credentials. I have no, no voir dire. All right. He will be accepted for that purpose. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Meese, um, are you personally acquainted with the respondent in this case, Mr. Jeffrey Clark? Yes, I am. And can you share with the committee how you made his acquaintance and what the nature of your relationship is? I have met uh, uh, the uh, person coming before this court as uh, uh, at various uh, bar events or uh, professional uh, events from uh, professional organizations of lawyers. Thank you. Moving to more substantive ma matters, I, I want to ask a few questions about assistant attorneys general. And I'll, I'll start with, what is an assistant attorney general? An assistant attorney general is a, a member of the uh, Department of Justice who is it, it generally uh, they they are they are uh, senior lawyers and in the organizational uh, uh, chart of the department they are uh, the third level of rank uh, and the responsibility the attorney general being the the first rank the deputy attorney general being the second rank, the uh, actually the, the uh, associate attorney general being the third rank, and actually the assistant attorneys general are the rank just below that, the fourth rank. And, and what are, I'm sorry, go ahead, finish your answers. Correct what I initially said, as them being in the third rank, they're actually in the fourth rank. I had almost forgotten about the associate. And what are some examples of job titles that an assistant attorney general might carry? Well, they may, they are basically uh, two types. There's attor assistant attorneys general that have to do with, with more general uh, functions like the assistant attorney general uh, the, the for an administrative affairs, the assistant attorney general for the uh, office of legal counsel, and the Assistant Attorney General for the Office of, of, of the Office of uh, Justice Programs. And are Assistant Attorneys General confirmed by the United States Senate? I'm sorry, say again. Are Assistant Attorney Generals confirmed by the United States Senate? Uh, yes, they are. I might mention also there are several Assistant Attorney Generals for specific legal uh, legal subjects, for example, tax, uh, environmental law, uh, uh, civil matters, civil rights, and tax, and uh, criminal things such as that. Are assistant attorneys generals constrained by the Constitution or other law to their particular jobs, or, or would you describe them as fungible in their jobs? Uh, assistant attorney generals are fungible, 
with the exception of two. Uh, one is that are limited to specific subjects, the uh, administrative administration, uh, attorney gen, assistant attorney general, and the national security assistant attorney general, who by statute are limited to their specific function. So to offer a specific um, example of that concept, would it be permissible for the president of the United States to assign a case or task to say, the assistant attorney general in charge of the criminal division that would ordinarily fall under the purview of the assistant attorney general in charge of the civil division? The question is, would they be able to be, to, uh, be normally in charge of one division and on some other uh, uh, and some other topic or some other situation, be assigned to another division to uh, command that division. The answer is yes. And what is this opinion of yours that you've offered uh, based on? This is the uh, the normal procedures of the department to have that happen from time to time. Um, I want to ask a few questions about uh, the opinions clause of the Constitution and starting very basically with what is your understanding of what the opinions clause is? Uh, that is a requirement for the president to receive opinions from the Department of Justice, from the Attorney General, and uh, from the uh, and to uh, request and receive information from the department. And um, do you understand to that clause to apply just to the attorney general or to other officers within the Department of Justice? It applies, I would, I would say, to all of the assistants in as much as they are, uh, they are uh, confirmed by the Senate of the United States. And could you explain to the committee why the opinions clause might be important to the functioning of the Department of Justice? Well, first of all, so that the president can receive information from those working in the, in the, in the department, it, should he require them. And it's also uh, proper for the information to be, to be provided. It is also it, the fact that they are confirmed by the Senate makes them principal officers. Does the Attorney General of the United States, or any other official for that matter, have the right to veto or block opinions clause requests from the President directed to inferior officials at the Department of Justice? Um, it is uh, possible for the President to do that, although normally he receives information via the Attorney General. However, that can be uh, modified from time to time. I understand, and I'll come back to that. Um, would, a would a communication from a principal officer of the United States to the president typically be covered by executive privilege? Uh, yes, and normally it would be. Might it also be covered by other privileges, such as the deliberative process, attorney, client, or law enforcement privilege? It is. It, it, it would be subject to such limitations. And why or why not might it be important for opinions clause communications to be subject to any or all of those privileges? Uh, yes, it would be. And particularly if the president made that request. You, you alluded a moment ago, uh, General Meese, to um, the way contacts between the Department of Justice and the White House normally occur. Do you recall that testimony? Uh, yes, that would be normally the situation, but that can be subject uh, also to the fact that the, the president himself could uh, to, uh, could uh, request information where the technical information that is contained in the answer uh, would be such that it would be better to have someone in the department uh, uh, usually accompanying the attorney general and uh, providing their the information that is requested by the president 
of a particularly legal technical matter. So to put it another way, um, would there be anything legally improper if unusual, the unusual though it may be, if the president wanted to meet personally with say, the attorney general in charge of the civil rights division, let's say. Yes. I'm yeah. sorry, did you mean the assistant attorney general? I think you may have misspelled. I'm sorry, what did I say? He said the attorney general in charge of the civil oh. rights division. I think you may have meant an assistant. Thank you for the correction. And I'll restate the whole question just so we're all here. Would there be anything legally improper with the president of the United States wanting to meet personally with, for example, the assistant attorney general in charge of the civil rights division? Uh, no, there would be nothing legally wrong with that. Inasmuch as the president has the entire executive branch is subject to the president. Would the Attorney General of the United States have any standing to enforce the contacts policy, policy against the president? The, if you would say again. Yeah, excuse me, maybe rephrase the question because standing has a technical meaning that I'm not sure you mean by the question. I understand. Would the Attorney General of the United States have any basis to object if the President of the United States wanted to talk directly with one of his inferior officers at the department? It would be unusual, but not legally wrong. Thank you. Moving now to a different subject, General Meese, uh, about, uh, about elections now. Um, under our Constitution, what... Uh, what part of government, uh, at federal or state level, has the responsibility for deciding who the presidential electors are going to be in a presidential election? Uh, they are selected by the various states and appointed by the governor of those states. Right. And so would the, would the Department of Justice have any legal right to give directions and orders to state actors in choosing electors? Uh, yes, they would. Could the Department of Justice, for example, uh, would there be any legal reason why the Department of Justice couldn't offer advice or suggestions to state government officials in the conduct of their elections? I know there would be no reason legally why they could uh, that could not happen. Have you reviewed the um, the letter purporting to be from Mr. Clark to officials in the state of Georgia that, that, that let's say, is at the heart of this uh, proceeding and the proceeding in Georgia, which you're also familiar with? Yes, I have. Um, are you aware of any legal or constitutional problem with the substance of that letter? I am familiar with it, yes. Are you Are you aware of any legal problems any legal prohibitions for such a letter being sent were, were one to decide to send it? No, I, I would see no legal problems. Can I have a, a moment to confer with co-counsel? Sure. <clears throat> I'll pass the witness, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, General Meese. Thank you very much. I have no Mr. questions. Okay. Does the panel have any questions? I have I have one question. Uh, you had indicated that it was important for the president to receive information from the department and that it was appropriate for him to receive information from the assistant attorney generals given that they are confirmed by the Senate. Did I understand that correctly? Uh, that, yeah, that that actually, uh, the president president technically could seek information from anybody in the Department of Justice, uh, but particularly, it's clear that the uh, assistant attorneys general are uh, principal officers, so it's even more appropriate for the president to to seek and to receive information directly from the Assistant Attorneys General. Would it make any difference if someone were an acting Assistant Attorney General? No, uh, they would have the same uh, authority 
if they were acting to turn, acting in that position. Even even if they weren't confirmed. Even if they were not confirmed. Okay. Yes. okay. Thank you. All right. I have no questions, General Meese. Did that stimulate any question? Not for me. Not from us. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it, and you're excused. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I call Heather Honey, who I believe is in the waiting room. This is the rebuttal witness about whom we've been speaking. Okay. Letting her in now. Thank you, Ms. Barassas. And I'm just getting ready to send counsel some uh, exhibits for this witness. I'm sorry. First of all, sending them doesn't do any good for me. Uh, yeah, that, that may be why am I being sent them to now? Well, I've, I've been handed quite a few exhibits that were not on the witness list that were offered for impeachment or rebuttal that I never saw until they were presented to the witness. And I'm actually uh, ahead of that with these with these exhibits. All right. First of all, do you have hard copies to hand him? I, I do not. I do not have hard copies for myself, Mr. Hirsch. All right. Well, that's something of a concern because sending an email to his office may not be the same as handing him a document. Um, is there a way of solving that problem? Where we're, uh, I, I don't know how many, you know, how much in bulk we're talking about or what these documents are. All right. In, in principle, if you're using this for rebuttal, it might be appropriate, but I don't know what they are and neither does he. And if you are going to use it, he's entitled to look at the whole document and not just the part that you pull up on the screen is my problem. If you recall yesterday, Mr. Hirsch, you asked or instructed uh, Mr. McDougall to give me whatever he had with respect to this witness about whom I had heard nothing before yesterday. Uh, I think you suggested if, for example, there are any transcripts that you provide them for me. I certainly think included within uh, that instruction would have been any exhibits that Mr. McDougall intended to offer. Got it. I am concerned about I mean, any uh, him having none of this stuff. Okay, I don't know what it is. I mean, maybe it's innocuous, or maybe it's stuff he already has and it has in one form or another. I don't know what it is, but. As a process, I think he ought to be able to look at the whole document. And, you know, that's why I sort of stopped the hearing earlier today and gave you a chance to read the document he was using, just, to, you know, as a matter of fairness. So um, I I don't know what we're talking about. And so it's hard for me to know what the solution is for it. Um, well, I could call, uh, I think I could put up another witness. Um, Mr. Schaefer at this point and push Ms. Honey back. Uh, but, Ms., you know, I just sent him to Mr. Harrell. He's got his laptop with him. Uh, I don't have access to a printer in the courtroom. All right. And in fact, I don't have an access to a printer at my hotel. I, I'm unable to print, which is why I have my laptop up here. Okay. Um, why don't we do this? Um, Mr. Harrell, can you have your office printed? What are we talking about? A thousand There's, pages? No, 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 no. We're talking pages, about, um, uh, I believe it's four documents. One, two, three, four, five documents. One of them is, the longest one is 39 pages, then there's four, four, two, six. Okay, so about 50 pages. All right. Um, Mr. Harrell, uh, Harrell, <laughs> this right. <laughs> Mr. Harrell, um, is it possible to, to send it to someone in your office to print out? And perhaps if we move the witness and uh, later you uh, can get them during a break that we'll take in between? Is that a possibility? I, I can certainly try to do that, yes. Okay. All right, Mr. Harrell, I appreciate that. Uh, would you like me to proceed with Ms. Honey now or? Push her back. Um, 
I, I don't know what place these exhibits do, and I also don't, don't know people's schedules. I, I, I have scheduling problems with two of the witnesses. So I've got Ms. Honey, Mr. Hari, and Mr. Uh, Schaefer. And uh, Ms. Honey is available all afternoon. Uh, Mr. Hari is not available, uh, to my understanding, until after 3.30 because of the doctor appointment. And Mr. Uh, Schaefer has a uh, commitment at 3.40. And All right. So it sounds like, it, it, I assume Mr. Schaefer's direct isn't that long. You're not no, it's pretty short. Schaefer okay. will be Why don't we down. take Mr. Schaefer okay. now, take a break. They can get the documents, put Ms. Okay. Ms. Honey on because uh, your other witness might not be ready by then anyway. Um, does that sound logical? Right, let me just message these witnesses if you if, if I could. Or if it's easier just to have her come on and explain this to her, I'm you know happy to do it that way. Uh, I'm at the chairman's disposal. Uh, okay, either way. Either way is okay. fine. I you know I don't want her sitting there thinking she's about to be called and then not knowing what's happening. Well, I think um, so that her testimony unfolds more smoothly. It would make more sense to have their documents, the documents in front of them, um, so that I can show her documents. And okay. And so we well, in that case, I, I don't think it makes sense to get started with her and then have to stop. So. Mr. Uh, Schaefer at last report was driving and um, will pull over in order to testify. Over. Okay. So that will be a first uh, for me. Well, better than driving. Yes, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And you contacted Ms. Honey? Uh, I sent her a text and told her uh, to stand by that we're going to do somebody else. Do you mind if I step out and make a phone call to Mr. Schaefer? Go for it. Thank you. Ms. Barasas, can you let us know if Mr. Schaefer comes into the waiting room? Yes, of course. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Apparently, I was misinformed, mm -hmm. and Mr. Schaefer is not available until after four, so I was going to, maybe we could go back to Ms. Honey. All right, how about this? Uh, why don't we take a break, see if, if Mr. Horrell can get the documents, and, and then pick up after the break, if that makes sense? Uh, yes, I'd be thankful for, for that. Okay. All right, why don't we break? Uh, is, is 15 minutes enough for you to check and get them, or do you need to? Someone's printing them down. I could meet them. 
Okay. So All right. Be enough so to, to, to two fifty. Okay. We're in recess then. Thank you.
off the record. Um, so uh, let's go on the record. All right, Mr. Fox, you wish to be heard? Yes, I do. So I've uh, received several exhibits. Uh, I don't have them necessarily in the order, uh, numerical order. Uh, response 567 is a report from the Pennsylvania Department of State dated May 14, 2021. Um, it's 30 some pages long. I have not had a chance to read it. Were I betting man, I would bet that it does not say that more votes were um, recorded than were cast in Pennsylvania, but I have not had a chance to read it. Um, then I have two newspaper articles, or I guess that's what they are. Now, one of them is undated, but it says, the headline is, it's called Fact-Checking Pennsylvania-Related Election Claims. Claims there were more votes than voters in Pennsylvania in the 2020 general election are false. Um, that sounds good to me, uh, but it's an undated uh, newspaper article. I have another, I guess it's news article. I, I, has, I shouldn't be using the word paper in this day and age. This may be an AP document. It's dated December not 29, 2020. The headline is the same. There were not more votes than voters in Pennsylvania. Um, I then have something called Pennsylvania Voter Deficit. Uh, and under it, it says Verity Vote, which I assume is the entity that wrote it. There's no human being that I could see, and I have to say I've not read this thoroughly. Uh, interestingly enough, it's, it says submitted February 10, 2021, edited March 9, 2022. It appears from this document that the conclusion is that there were 121,240 more ballots than voters. That's all I really know. I haven't had a chance to read it. Uh, and then I have something from the County of York, Elections and Voter Registration Office, office dated August 31, 2021, which I believe is an attempt to explain why someone might believe inaccurately that there were more votes than votes recorded, votes recorded than votes cast in York County. The first thing I note is that this appears, uh, has been represented, that what this is is an effort to rebut the testimony of Mr. McDo, uh, sorry, not Mr. McDo, uh, Mr. Donahue and Mr. Rose. If you'll recall, the testimony was that on the 27th of December in 2020, uh, Mr. Donahue got a call, or, or, and Mr. Rosen participated in a call with the president in which the president was saying there were 205 or 250,000 more votes counted in Pennsylvania than cast. Mr. Donahue said he had not heard that allegation before, that he checked it out, and a few days later reported that it was not true, uh, and so forth. Now, that was in December of 2020. This is going to be rebutted, apparently, by a report, which I, I the earliest uh, date for it is it said it was submitted February 10, 2021. I don't know how uh, that can re rebut what Mr. Donahue said in December. In other words, he said they conducted their investigation and so forth. Somebody later says they, I guess they disagree, doesn't rebut it. And the important point here, of course, is that the Department of Justice was actively checking out and investigating all the allegations that were brought to its attention. Um, and, of course, the Pennsylvania uh, State Report and this thing from York County are also later in 2021. So uh, I don't know what we're doing here, but this is not rebuttal testimony of Mr. Donahue. Uh, he, he certainly, you know, I don't know what this document is, but he, it's certainly not an official document. And he had no way of knowing about it since it hadn't even been written at the time that he uh, testified about um, look, rather than argue this back and forth when we have witness waiting, all right, Mr. Fox, I take your point. It may be that this testimony goes nowhere and doesn't, you know, assist their case. 
it may be the documents for the reasons you described don't prove it. Although sometimes what you want is one sentence from a 39 page document and it's impossible for you to know what sentence they're going to use. So I'd rather just deal with this on the concrete. And if you're right, I mean, I assume that we're talking about something like 20 minutes of testimony or something, um, you know, and understand it in context. If, if when a particular question arises, there's something that seems particularly unfair about the question, you know, in the context of it or particular use of documents, I'd rather not try to describe it in an, in the abstract based. I have no reason to think your summary is incorrect, but based on your summary from a quick skim of documents, I'd rather not decide it quite that way. Uh, I do think they are limited to providing information that actually rebuts other testimony. So to the extent it may be offered, as affirmative evidence, it should have been on their their list. So, but I don't understand that it's being offered for that purpose. I, I want to just reiterate my my emphatic objection to this. This is he hasn't followed the rules. You're not enforcing the the rule that you uh, that you imposed, and I and, and it's a complete sandbag, and it's very unfair. Okay, noted. Uh, I call Heather Honey. And if I could be admitted to the Zoom in case I would need to yes. show document. Yes, letting you both in. Thank you. Good afternoon, Miss Honey. Can you hear me? I can. My name is Meryl Hirsch. I'm the chair of this hearing committee, and I'm going to swear you in. Do you want to swear or affirm the truth of the testimony you're going to give here? I do. Uh, which which is it? Do you, do you want I to swear? swear? Okay. Could you raise your right hand, please? Um, do you solemnly swear that the testimony you are going to give in this proceeding will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Right. Could you please state your full name for the record? Heather, honey. All right. Thank you very much. Please proceed, Mr. McDougall. Uh, Ms. Honey, uh, how are you employed presently? Um, I, I'm i self-employed. I have a small business that I operate. And uh, so I'm sort of all things, CEO, CFO, all of that. Chief cook and bottle washer? Yep, that too. All right. Uh, what is your educational background? Um, I have a degree from Westchester University, um, and uh, in addition to, I think probably what you were asking me is, you know, I, I'm I'm self-employed, but I am also um, the executive director of the Election Research Institute. Uh, that's a nonprofit, so um, it's it is uh, volunteer work, but I I am the executive director of that organization as well. All right, ma'am. And uh, what is your work experience? Well, so I have been an investigator for over 30 years, uh, doing investigations in the you know government, corporate uh, sectors. And uh, in addition to that, in the last, say, 10 years or so, I um, also have been training people in um, open source intelligence and open source investigations. All right. Um, did you at some point become interested in the November 2020 presidential election? I did. And uh, where have you focused your attention? What state? Um, well, I think I got started in Pennsylvania. I live in Pennsylvania. So uh, my experience on Election Day in my polling place, um, you know, led me to be concerned about the operations, you know, the the conduct of the elections in, in my particular precinct. And um, so that led me to um, doing some, some research and investigations into Pennsylvania. Um, and, uh, you know, Pennsylvania in 2020, it was the first year that Pennsylvania had no excuse mail voting. And so, um, you know, I think all of the election officials were just trying to figure things out, but there were there were quite a few um, issues and and my voting precinct was no different. And so um, you've been your, the most focus, the greatest focus of your work uh, on election matters has been Pennsylvania. Yeah, Pennsylvania, Arizona, Georgia, uh, 
generally those those three states have been have been my focus. All right, ma'am, are you familiar with a uh, claim or controversy about whether there were more votes than voters in Pennsylvania in 2020? I am. How are you familiar with that? So I, um, well, I worked with my state representative, Frank Ryan, um, on some research around that um, in the sort of aftermath of the 2020 election. Um, you know, as I mentioned, there were quite a few issues in, in my particular situation. Um, when I went to vote, the um, elderly couple in front of me, um, the the gentleman, you know, uh, went to sign in um, and he was given a ballot. But when his wife attempted to sign in, uh, she was told that she had already voted by mail. And of course, she insisted that she had not done that, which is sort of what prompted me to figure out what are the what were the controls in place to make sure that um, that that couldn't happen, right? That somebody couldn't uh, submit a ballot um, on somebody else's behalf and so on. And um, uh, after doing some, some research in that area, I reached out to my state representative to share with him some of the, the concerns that, that I had. And um, he happens to be a, a CPA. So, um, you know, he was able to kind of uh, fact check a lot of the stuff that, that I had discovered. And uh, then he went about the process of trying to get some answers. Um, you know, I was unable to get through to anybody in the Department of State's office. But um, since he was an elected representative, he had a little bit more access than I did. So. All right. Are you familiar with the claim uh, that was made uh, in the November, December time frame, maybe early January? that uh, in Pennsylvania, something over 200,000 more votes than voters had been uh, recorded? Yes, that, that is uh, absolutely the case. So Pennsylvania law requires the uh, county boards prior to certification to compare the number of people who voted to the number of ballots cast for each election precinct and um, if there are any discrepancies, in other words, if the number of ballots exceeds the number of people who voted, then the board is supposed to investigate those discrepancies prior to certification and prior to recording any votes from those precincts. Um, so that's that's in Pennsylvania statute. Um, it's it's required. So what what we were able to do is. Um, the you know Pennsylvania's voter registration system is also where the voter history is kept, and and that's also in statute. Uh, Pennsylvania statute twelve twenty two says that the Shore system must contain a record of every person who voted and the method by which they cast their ballot. So those two uh, parts of our election code um, require that that vote history be captured in the Shore system. So. Um, in Pennsylvania, we are allowed to obtain um, a snapshot of the Shore system, the, the voter database. Um, every week, it's updated by the Department of State, um, and you can purchase that. So um, we started purchasing it from the election every week um, from, from election all the way through February uh, 2021, which is when uh, finally the last two counties uh, finished uh entering their election day vote histories and closed the election in the system. Did I hear you say that um, counties certified their results before they actually finished the election? Right. So, so the way that the shore system works is that as somebody, so, so the shore system actually works as a way to, uh, verify that um, a person, when they return a mail ballot, that the mail ballot can be accepted. In fact, um, when a mail ballot is returned, it cannot be opened. The envelope can't be opened unless it is first scanned into the shore system to verify that the barcode on the outside um, is valid and it's it hasn't been canceled or it hasn't it's not a duplicate. So every single mail ballot, an absentee ballot, that is returned 
must necessarily be entered into the shore system before it can ever be counted, right? So, so it serves as that as that purpose as well. But um, so what happened was some of the counties who were using, for example, paper poll books. So in order to get the uh, vote history um, from the paper poll books into the shore system, <clears throat> next to the names in the poll book, there's a barcode similar to the barcode on the envelope. And so they actually have to be scanned into the shore system to, to update the vote history for in-person voting. And then of course, there are counties that use electronic poll books. And so that information is, is transferred, obviously automatically, uh, you know, electronically. But to, to answer your question, which I think you're, you know, is it possible that these counties certified without reconciling? And unfortunately, the, the answer is yes. Um, there were many counties. Now, I, I want to say that that more than half of Pennsylvania counties reconciled beautifully prior to certification. Um, so it was only uh, about half that had that had problems, and and really only about a you know a, a dozen or so that had really substantial discrepancies. Mr. Chairman, uh, I am not hearing any rebuttal testimony uh, whatsoever in this from this witness. I will direct the witness uh, to the topic. Um, all right, ma'am, uh, I'm going to show you a document. That I had marked as um, exhibit R565 and ask if uh, you are familiar with that document and the claims that are made in this document. I am. And the uh, this is addressing and uh, refuting or uh, objection to what to have Mr. McDougal okay. characterizing the document. All right, I, I, I withdraw the question. Um, Ms. Honey, what what it, uh, who first of all who put this out? If you know, yeah, the Department of State posted that on their website. All right, ma'am. And what uh, do you understand this document to be saying? Do we have a date, please? Sure. Uh, do you know when this document was posted? Um, I don't know when it was posted, but much of what is in here um, is is similar to what the Department of State has has said all along. Uh, you know, without actually looking at the at the at the data, um, but but this this is at least um, most. It, it has to be post May of uh, 2021 because it references a report that the Department of State put out in May of 2021. So had to be after that. And the on the particular question of whether there were more votes than voters, what had objection? Been this before? document has not been admitted. I'm not asking about the document. I'm asking a different question. Okay, but you're showing the witness the document, and I'm not quite sure why we're looking at a document okay. from May 2021. Right. With respect to this issue of whether there were more votes than voters, what was the position of the Pennsylvania Department of State in November and December of 2020? Uh, essentially, what they said is that some of the counties were still in the process of uploading their vote histories, and that um, that the the issue, the only thing that they really were uh, concerned about was how many ballots uh, were cast and how many votes were counted for each candidate. Um, and of course, the the problem there, as the state representatives pointed out. Oh, objection. Yeah. The question was, what was the position of the state of Pennsylvania, not what the problem was? And also, this witness is testifying as an expert, as if she's been qualified as an expert, and that's not appropriate. Yeah, I, I, I think the second part of, I think that objection is fair, sustained. All right, Ms. Honey. Um, so, uh, what was the position of the Department of State of Pennsylvania on this issue of whether there were more votes than voters in uh, November, December of 2020? I think that's just been answered. Just give me a quick, crisp answer to that, if you would. They said it was not true. Have you looked into, as a part of your efforts, uh, whether there were more votes than voters? Yes. And what have you found? Objection. You know, timing. 
Yeah, well, what's the timing on her own examination? Uh, what is the timing of your work on that topic, Ms. Honey? So we examined the uh, shore data export every single week from the election all the way through February of 2021. So each and every week, we looked at the total number of voters who had vote credit um, and compared that to the certified county results of the total ballots cast in each county. And um, like I said, um, there were uh, significant discrepancies. What type of discrepancy? Objection. It sounds to me like she just said that they made that. that's, well, I don't want to uh, comment on, uh, I don't want to say too much with a witness here, but um, I think there's still a, a serious timing issue here. She said until February 2021. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Can you ask her to focus on what discrepancies were yes. were known as of were there, January 3rd? Okay. Were there any discrepancies between the number of votes and the number of voters that you found in the period of your work prior to January 3rd of 2021? Yeah, there were, um, as of uh, December 21st, um, which is when the representatives, um, uh, you know, first uh, raised the issue with the Department of State, the discrepancy was about 205,000. And uh, as a result of your weekly checking uh, with the data from the Secretary of State's office, up through January 3rd, did that discrepancy resolve or decrease? The, the discrepancy did de decrease and, and I would like to so so at the time that the um, that the representatives uh, you know released this information, we we had noted that there were still counties that had not yet completed their uh, voter history. So when when we put out the 205 thousand discrepancy, um, we noted that there were some counties that had not yet, um, closed the election and and so therefore were incomplete but but many of the counties had and uh, and again the election had already been certified so um, so the the requirement in Pennsylvania law of course is that the objection uh, this is more expert testimony yeah not responsive to the questions all right I think she answered your question before Thanks. she got into the last uh, all right Miss honey uh, the uh, was it possible to say definitively that the discrepancy had been completely resolved before all the counties completed and closed their election? Objection, leading. Well, all right. it is leading, but he said it already. I'll, I'll allow it. So, so uh, you know, at, at that time, um, there were 63 out of 67 counties in Pennsylvania that had closed out their elections, and there were uh, significant discrepancies in many of them. And um, and so, you know, what could you say they would they would be resolved? Well, again, the, the election had already been certified, and all of the vote histories had been uploaded at that point. So you know, the answer is, you know, if somebody had looked into it at that time, um, they would have seen that these were actual discrepancies. By January the 3rd, had it been debunked that there were more votes than voters in Pennsylvania? Objection. So relevant. And first of all, I don't know how she has the, I mean, that's an opinion question. But I'll rephrase the question, Mr. Chairman. By January 3rd, were there, was there still a discrepancy between the number of votes and the number of voters in Pennsylvania? Yes, there's a discrepancy to this day. That's the question, my questions for this witness, your witness, Mr. Fox. Uh, could we put up 
Respondents Exhibit 566. And I, you know, I don't know, Emily, do you have that? That's one of the new exhibits. Yeah, can you give her your copy of funds? Yeah. Okay, so just give it a hand. I don't have a copy for the no, the committee, but I think I can accomplish this. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say give her a paper copy. She's not here. Um, <laughs> uh, I can, I can uh, share it from last week. Thank you. I just sent it to you. 566. Okay. We have it now. I'm showing you What's been marked for identification is response exhibit 566. It appears to be an article from the Associated Press dated December 29, 2020, that says there were not more votes than voters in Pennsylvania. And says, are you familiar with this article? I am. Okay, did you see it on or about the time it, uh, it, it was published? Uh, about the time, yeah. All right, um, move this into evidence. No objection. And um, be admitted. The article says claim there are 205,000 more votes than voters in the 2020 election in Pennsylvania. AP's assessment false. This analysis is based on incomplete data according to the Pennsylvania Department of State. Correct? I read that right? You read that right, but it's not right. correct. Now, you, uh, I'd like you to take a look now at Exhibit 563. Oh, uh, was there any public information? Um, no, what's wrong? Uh, let's look at Exhibit 563. Tell us what this is. Uh, this is our uh, report that we published uh, regarding the discrepancy in the. Um, and you published this in on February. It, it says submitted February 10, 2021, edited March 9, 2022. So when was it actually made public? Um, I believe it was uh, posted on the website in 2022. Thank you. That's all the questions I have, Ms. Witness. No further questions, Mr. Chairman. Any questions from the panel? Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Ms. Honey. I really appreciate your time, and you are excused. Mr. Chairman, I find myself in the uncomfortable predicament of not having a witness ready to call right this minute. Uh, I have texted Mr. Hari, who would be the first to come available of the remaining two. I don't have a response. So I, I, what, would the, what would be the chair's pleasure at this point? I mean, know some good songs. <laughs> um, all right, look, why don't we, I assume you're expecting a response momentarily from one or the other or both of them, is that? going on uh i'll let the i'll let y'all know as soon as i know uh but until they get back to me i'm sort of stuck all right why don't we take 15 minutes and and uh and perhaps informally come back here and see if you have more information then rather oh, than you know. very good thank you very very much okay so we're talking um i guess it's just before 345, yeah, 343 or something like that. But we'll check in and see if you very good things have changed. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. All right, we're in recess.
Please proceed. I call uh, Harry Hari, who is in the Zoom waiting room. All right, we have someone named Zoom user. I assume that's him. I'm gonna let them in. Mr. Hardy? Uh, yes. Hi. Um, my name is Meryl Hirsch, and I'm the hearing committee chair for this hearing. And I'm going to swear you in. Um, Certainly. Could you, would you prefer to, to swear or to affirm the truth of the testimony you're going to give in this proceeding? I'm willing to swear in. Okay. Could you raise your right hand, please? Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you are going to give in this proceeding will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God? I do. Could you please state your full name for the record and spell your name also? My name is Harry Robert Howery III. My last name is spelled H-A-U-R-Y. First name, standard spelling, H-A-R-R-Y. Middle name, Robert, R-O-B-E-R-T. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. It's Howry. Howry. It's okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Please proceed, Mr. McDougall. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Hari. Uh, thank you for coming. So I, uh, first, I'd like to ask you what your educational background is. Uh, I went to Washington University in St. Louis. I have a chemical engineering degree with a subspecialty in system science mathematics. And I have an MBA with a specialty in finance and operations research. Uh, also Both from Washington University. Okay. And uh, how are you currently employed? Um, well, I'm, I'm self-employed as a consultant. Uh, I also... Uh, I'm acting CEO of Kane and Associates, a cyber forensics firm based in West Virginia. And I'm acting, I'm also the chairman of the board of a, a corporation that's doing work on election validity uh, called United Sovereign Americans. Unpaid position, volunteer. The, the, the court reporter asked you to repeat the name of the organization. Uh, United Sovereign Americans or American, just singular. Uh, could you please take us through your work history? Um, I started in the energy industry. Um, I was in the energy industry, uh, worked up to the uh, being vice president of operations and chief engineer of uh, a gas distribution, uh, integrated natural gas and oil utility, essentially. We did everything from exploration and development to distribution of natural gas uh, in the St. Louis area. Um, after that, I became an entrepreneur uh, working on advanced computer systems, um, mainly automated workflow. Um, started doing uh, government consulting work uh, as a defense contractor. Uh, through that work, I became involved with the U.S. Treasury. Uh, after that, the Department of Defense, um, eventually Department of Justice, uh, various intelligence community activities, uh, supporting different R&D projects, uh, including the CIA and NSA and NRO and I held the TSSCI clearances uh, uh, for a time, uh, as well as secret and top secret clearances. 
All right, sir. So about how many years did you serve as a, a contractor to the government? Uh, almost 35, uh, 33, actually. So is that in the rearview mirror or is there more of that in the future? <laughs> That's as far as I know, you never quite leave some things, but uh, as far as I know, it's in the rearview mirror as of uh, 2019. All right, sir. Um, what is um, an information assurance directorate? Does that phrase uh, mean anything to you? Uh, yes, yeah, so I was... I worked as a contractor for the NSA as a senior uh, designer and architect of systems in the R&D area, uh, specifically the Information Assurance Directorate, which is responsible for cybersecurity, uh, cyber resiliency, and cyber availability, which is an older term. They don't use it as much anymore, but uh, I worked primarily uh, in the R and D area, so did a lot of work on a number of highly classified systems. I can't talk about still, but some of the ones I can talk about are, you know, the com nuclear command and control system and White House communications continuity system, the defense uh, messaging system, these types of systems. Most of my work in these areas was classified, but the actual contracts were open. All right, sir. Uh, have you done any work uh, for the Federal Emergency Management Agency? I have. Uh, I was the primary designer of the architecture of the Integrated Public Alert and Warning System, uh, oh, as well as... Hold up, sir. I, I think you may have said Federal Emergency Management Institute. Did you mean administration? I meant to say... FEMA, Federal yeah. Emergency Management Agency. Yeah. Agency, yeah. I apologize. Okay, uh, for please continue, thinking. Mr. Howard. Please. I go. was the primary design architect, uh, along with another architect at uh, Sandia National Laboratories, uh, where I did other work uh, as well. But um, the primary uh, system that you know of that's associated with IPAWS uh, is the uh, cell phone alert system when there's a amber alert or whatnot. But there are many other roles of IPAWS for sending critical uh, information around the DHS, DOD, and, and uh, law enforcement networks, as well as public networks like the cell system. You mean it's your fault that I get those amber alerts? Actually, that would be Verizon and at and I didn't suggest the profile of that particular design. I was overruled, so. Okay. Um, now, um, is, I'm gonna read a phrase to you, which means nothing to me and ask you if it means anything to you. Certified information SSP certification. So that's the uh, certified uh, information security, um, let's see, professional, no, it's information security systems professional. It's an accreditation that exists mostly for practitioners. I was an engineer designer architect uh, for these systems. I did help uh, write uh, some of the early uh, NIST components that were incorporated into the uh, uh, CISSP uh, tests. And NIST, as you use it there, is National Institute of Standards? Yes, and technology. <clears throat> do you know what the Help America Vote Act is? I do. Uh, coincidentally, as a young man, I, I was uh, politically active uh, in Missouri and uh, as such, I became involved with uh, St. Louis County politics and eventually as a, uh, what you would call a casual consultant to uh, uh, our election commission. I helped redesign it. By this time, I was starting to do um, automated workflow systems, high volume automated workflow systems, mostly for banks. Um, they were 
even early on looking at using scanners and we're trying to understand how to automate workflow to make election conduct more efficient and eventually use uh, images, images for uh, adjudicating and processing ballots. So uh, Paul De Gregorio was an associate of mine uh, in the Queenie Township Republican organization. Um, and he invited me in when he was appointed by John Ashcroft uh, as governor uh, to the St. Louis County, uh, well, in cooperation with the governor um, to the St. Louis County Board of Elections. So I had extensive experience trying to understand the operational aspects of the St. Louis County system at the time. And uh, later, uh, as things developed, uh, Paul moved on with John Ashcroft and the George Bush uh, administration. Uh, Ashcroft was appointed to write uh, Hava along with hundreds of other people. And uh, Paul D. Gregorio was chosen to be kind of the head of that effort. Uh, they're trying to do high-speed scanning, uh, image recognition, automated recognition, and I'm still an expert in that area um, at that time. <laughs> I haven't done much with it since, but the, um, but the fact of the matter is I, I spent a lot of time helping them understand how banks control images of checks and how they they square the check images and the check processing with the actual items. In general, it's called item processing in the industry. I helped design also the Check 21 Act, uh, which eventually becomes the ACH system or the Automated Clearinghouse System. Uh, that was done with the Federal Reserve and the Comptroller of the Currency out of Boston. All right, sir. And uh, so are you familiar with uh, Help America Vote Act or HAVA sort of top to bottom or are there subsets that you're more familiar with? Well, there are a few that I'm more familiar with than others, but I'm I'm pretty well top to bottom familiar with it. The the the, the non-voluntary parts and the actual uh, initial drafting of the voluntary uh, system guidelines were uh, things that I heavily participated in. As a matter of fact, much of the technical overview of the operations were, were copied, uh, normalized for elections instead of check processing, but they were copied from uh, operating manuals that we used in, uh, in various image processing systems and in large banks, you know, banks that did 30 million uh, or more uh, checks a day in a single counting center. Um, does HAVA impose uh, any requirements or standards on computerized voting machines or election systems? Yeah, it, so it's a, it's a confusing aspect of the law, but yes, it does in situations where the uh, states have decided to accept HAVA funding and become a HAVA compliant, thereby become a HAVA compliant a state. There are a number of states that are not HAVA states. Um, there is uh, one aspect of HAVA, not in the voluntary system guidelines, but in the uh, in the actual law itself. So there's two parts. There's the external reference. It's you know depending on which version you're talking about. It's the voluntary voter systems guidelines or the voluntary system guidelines. Those are external. And they only become mandatory uh, to generally comply with them uh, if you become a HAVA state, except for one thing, the accuracy standards on electronic tabulation systems are specified in HAVA as a reference to the 2002 version of the voluntary guidelines. It's th section 3.2.1. I happen to remember it because it's something that we pay attention to. I don't pretend to know all of the HAVA regulations by heart. It's quite extensive. All right, sir. Are you familiar with something called the Critical Infrastructure Information Act? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, it, it was, uh, I, I assume you're talking about the, the, the or which one, the cybersecurity 
an infrastructure security agency act of 2002 is that what you're referring to or no, actually I'm, uh, it may be the same statute and a different title uh, 2018 i'm sorry i got the date wrong completely um but it, whether that law or the one that i'm hoping to refer to uh makes any reference to a role for the department of justice are you familiar with that uh yes all right, sir. And uh, are you aware of whether that statute or act relates in any way to election equipment? So this the statute actually enables the creation of CISA, the, and uh, CISA uh, is assigned to the Department of Homeland Security, and it has uh, a federal agency role of advising uh, for cybersecurity matters on critical national infrastructure, uh, which eventually includes uh, election infrastructure. All right. Are you familiar with something called the Federal Information Security Modernization Act? Yes. Uh, there, there's actually two FISMAs. Uh, it's a little bit confusing to people, but the Federal Information Security Modernization Act was the update of the original uh, FISMA. It was done in 2000, and I, I, I believe, to the best of my recollection, in 2014. Uh, it updates the original FISMA, which was the Federal Information Security Management Act, and that was in 2002, I believe. I was active in government contracting at the time, did a lot of work with FISMA, both FISMAs, actually. Okay. And are you familiar with how either or both FISMAs relate to critical infrastructure? So FISMA, uh, the second one mandates that federal agencies advise and use a process of risk management ass uh, assessment called the Risk Management Framework. And uh, this is implemented in the second of the two FISMAs, the Federal Information Security Modernization Act. It defines the way a federal agency should advise other agencies on or, or require their own agency to comply with information security uh, All right, sir. issues. Uh, at this point, I tender Mr. Howery as an expert on HAVA standards as applied to election equipment and uh, the relate and the further application of the Critical Infrastructure Information Act and the FISMAs to election equipment. If uh, council would like to board our witness. Mr. Fox. Mr. Howie, my name is Hamilton Fox. I just have a few questions. As I understand it, you got involved uh, with the state elections in Missouri um, when John Ashcroft was the governor of Missouri. Is that right? It was actually before John Ashcroft got involved. Okay. And when was that roughly in terms of years? Ashcroft would have been governor uh -huh. in the 90s. Yeah, it was in the 1990s or late 1980s. He he runs pretty much consecutive, so it would have been eight plus four. So he loses his reelection as senator in 19, what, 90? Well, no, it would have been the year 2000. So it would have gone the 12 years prior to that. So just the late 1980s. Okay. Um, and after that, um service and, and and did you have a title or were you just sort of as a consultant uh, it's just i uh, a volunteer consultant would be the right title okay and um so what proportion of your sort of work time did you spend in that capacity i didn't spend any regular work time it was all off hours or personal time that was being used yeah, not I, compensated. I, I phrased that badly. I did not mean to suggest that you had 
somehow you know cheated your boss or something like that. Uh, but but it, on a weekly basis, how, how much time do you spend on that? Uh, during the period from the 2000 election until 2001, I would say I probably was, was spending an average of 10 hours a week. And after 2001, have you had any involvement with uh, state election boards or something uh, equivalent since that time? Uh, mostly since 2020. I mean, we we did some work in various uh, commercial efforts uh, with regard to security issues um, uh, and administration issues, but it was relatively minor and incidental to our work uh, until 2020. In which case I become involved in the election examination. Right. Um, now, your experience, and I, one of the reasons I was slow getting up here is I was trying to write down all those initials, um, but <laughs> your, your experience with HAVA and I, I, critical, what, what was the other thing, CISA, what did that stand for, or, or critical structure information? Uh, well, the the actual act name is Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency Act of 2018, I believe. That's the best of my memory. It was signed under the Trump administration. And whom were you advising uh, about the uh, application of those acts? Uh, most of my work was with the Amistad Project, Phil Klein. Um, I, you know, I've, I've talked to many of the people that were involved in the election controversies, but uh, the fact is that the work from the election period to the end of December was uh, almost, I'd say, 98% for Phil Klein. Okay, and, and I asked you a bad question. I apologize. Prior to, let, let's, let's put aside the 2020 election for the moment. So... During, as I understood you, uh, your testimony, you became familiar with HAVA and these other statutes sometime between 2001 and 2020. Is that is that fair? I became familiar with HAVA between 2000. It wasn't HAVA yet. It was the origination of what becomes HAVA in, uh, in 2000 and about 2003 was the end of any any discussions. Most of the work ended in 2001 when it was turned over mostly to lawyers to, to, to you know, paper it up and to get it, get it through Congress. I had nothing to do with uh, lobbying or adv even advising senators and House members on this legislation. Yeah, and, and so what I'm trying to, to understand is during this early period in the early part of the century, um, what you were actually doing with respect to HAVA? Were you advising people about it? What, what, what exactly? I was, give, I was giving them advice and direction on how to design a secure system and a, a manageable system for running elections using the model of high-speed item processing in a bank. And, and so this was in the 2001-2003 period, correct? Correct. All right. And after that point, what again before the 2020 election? What was your involvement with HAVA issues? Direct involvement, very little. Indirect involvement, there were a number of uh, issues that were discussed with regard to network safety and whatnot. At the time, the protection profiles were being managed by the NSA, and so I had incidental contact with the national what were called the protection profiles that become the NIST protection profiles that become now basically the CISA uh, protection profiles. So the part of how you protect machines and networks and the processing of data, I've been continuously involved in since uh, the late 1990s. And in this post-2003 period up until 2020, these machines and networks that you were involved with protecting were what kinds of machines and networks? Defense Department networks, uh, U.S. government networks, uh, 
civil networks that were considered to be important, like banking networks, um, these types of networks. But it was a general practice of what it takes to protect particular types of technology, like routers and operating systems and, and particular types of machines, like Windows machines and, and these types of things. So my expertise was very general with regard to cybersecurity and the design of properly uh, implemented uh, and the control of properly implemented secure systems, ranging from, you know, things that would be keeping records for a DMV all the way up to uh, Defense Department uh, National Emergency Communication. And then, and would I be correct um, that after the 2020 election, you got back involved in uh, the mechanics of the election process. That's correct, directly, that's correct. And was that because you were disappointed or, or with the results of the 2020 election? No, it was because they needed a cybersecurity expert to review the machines and they, they didn't have one. And they happened to know me and they invited me to come up. I did not volunteer. Okay. Per se. <laughs> but after I got involved, I became a full-time volunteer for two months. And who is the they that invited you up? The original invitation comes from uh, uh, Wilson Powell and Andrew Giuliani and okay. Steve Bannon. Who are they? Uh, well, Wilson Powell is the son of Sidney Powell. Uh, Andrew Giuliani is the son of Rudy Giuliani. And uh, Steve Bannon's the host of uh, War Room Pandemic at the time. And so these individuals asked you to get involved in taking a look at the 2020 election. Is that, is that right? Actually, the, the original aspect of, of what they asked me for was to look at cybersecurity concerns with regard to election machines. And, and they didn't know, actually, that I had election experience when they asked me to come up. They were more concerned. I mean, there was a story, as we all know, going around about international hacking. Uh, one of my ex you know particular experiences was in... Uh, finding hackers and, and, and designing tools for our side to use against other people. So it was, uh, you know, an area of expertise I had, and it was fairly, you know, I, I wouldn't say fairly, it was current. And, uh, and so they wanted somebody to review it. Uh, because of the national security overlay of a lot of what I did, they didn't really want me doing much in the way of high-profile work. They just wanted my opinions. And from that, I got to know many of the people that have been involved in the, in the controversy surrounding uh, the election equipment. And but my, my position has been primarily that uh, you don't need to prove that the systems were hacked to prove that there's problems. The, you know, most people don't understand it. Well, information we, systems include operational okay, requirements okay. And, and use as well. So I'm trying to get into your opinions quite yet. Um, uh, sure. when, when you were hired by uh, Sidney Powell's son and Rudolph Giuliani's son, uh, was were they at the time um, involved in contesting the uh, 2020 election? Not at that time, no. This was a day after the election. They're just trying to figure out if something untoward happened. Okay. And um, so it was subsequent to that that they filed various lawsuits challenging the outcome of the yeah, election. Yeah, by that time, I wasn't working with Sidney Powell or Rudy Giuliani or, or any of those crews. I was just exclusively working with uh, Phil Klein. And who's Phil Klein? Phil Klein was the head of the manager of the Amistad project. He's also a uh, former attorney general of Kansas. And uh, the principal litigator there was Eric Cardall. And were you working with Klein in an effort uh, for him to bring uh, election contests? Yes. Okay. Um, have you ever testified as an expert before? in 
Let me just let me back off. Have you, did you testify as an expert in any of the election contest cases that were brought? I submitted expert an expert report in Phil Klein's submission uh, to the Supreme Court in several of his state. Uh, he he used the same expert report. My my business partner and I both submitted uh, testimony as expert reports. We never were questioned. All those cases were thrown out on standing. Well, that's not quite true. The, the Wisconsin case continued, but I don't think our testimony was included in Wisconsin, though, but I'm not sure to tell you the honest truth. Um, I don't recall. And have you ever testified in court as an expert in any capacity? Uh not in an unclassified fashion, no. I'm not quite sure I follow that. What do you mean in an un there, there are there are sealed courts that 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 I've had testimony in front. Okay. Um and as an expert? Court, yes. Judge qualified you as an expert. Yes. And what, I've what, been qualified by the as an expert by the DOD, the Department of Justice, the Treasury Department, a number of other departments as well. Okay, I'm, I'm considered a qualified system matter expert by the U.S. government. Yeah, no, I, I'm. I, I understand that, and I'm not questioning that. What I'm trying to find out is whether, and I, I'm, my question is not be clear, but the process that we're going through now is to decide whether the uh, the panel will qualify you as an expert, recognize you as an expert. And what I'm trying to ask you is whether any judge has ever done that before. Uh, as a system matter expert, no. Um, and you have you published anything about the HAVA standards for uh, election equipment? About the HAVA standards, uh, yes, I've Correct. talked about it. I've I've published about what the standards mean from a cybersecurity and operational perspective. You know, generally what advice people are giving with regard to interpreting the law. Uh, of course, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't offer legal advice. But and 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 in what publications have you published those articles? Mostly on podcasts and whatnot um the publications you know the the other publications i've had on on cybersecurity and whatnot have mostly been inside of agencies and they wouldn't have been publicly published per se and, and they might be able to be found on the internet I, nothing ever disappears from the internet and, and these publications and agencies were they about election equipment no, they were about cybersecurity and proper design of cybersecurity systems. Okay, and um, and I again, I couldn't quite get everything that uh, Mr. McDougall said, but I think he was said he was also going to ask you questions about the uh, Critical Situation Information Act and how that applied to election equipment. And is, have you published articles in publications about that subject? I don't know if any of my writings have been picked up in publications or not. I didn't publish any myself uh, per se, except uh, United Sovereign Americans has has had some of their work published, but I didn't, you know, I, which ones have gotten published and which ones haven't been published. I don't, to tell you the truth, no. United, so, United, United Sovereign Americans. And that's the organization that you formed um, in the last couple of years, is that right? Last last year, actually. Okay. Um, and uh, that's a, what, a volunteer organization? It's fully volunteer, yes. And you um, concern yourselves with election security? Is that what I believe you testified to? We consider, our, we concern ourselves with election validity. Again, I'm not just a cybersecurity expert. I'm an operational security expert. The two are completely different okay all right um thank you very much i uh i do object to this for similar because i think it's 
similar to the, uh, I think it's Mr. Smith. Uh, actually, it's sort of a combination of uh, credentials of Mr. Smith and Mr. Farida, uh, because I don't think, you know, his expertise is in the area of elections. All right. Um, first of all, I think, well, okay. Um, I haven't heard what his opinions are, and um, I will uh, allow him to testify as an expert on the general matters that were described. And, and the, if specific application with respect to elections, you know, becomes a part of it, I'll consider that in evaluating the testimony. I, I do not intend to tread the same ground as uh, with Mr. Smith. Okay. All right, sir. Um, now, um, talking about, well, you, you said there was a difference between operational security and cybersecurity. Could you explain that, please? So generally, information assurance deals with three aspects of security. One is whether or not the machine that you're talking about, a router or computer or operating system, is secure. But there's another aspect of security that people often don't understand, but it's easily illustrated. When you go into a bank, their servers aren't out in an open space. They're behind a locked door. And this is an operational security aspect. It's considered safe to have it behind a guarded locked door. So operational security systems connect to cybersecurity systems to provide a secure uh, use context. And so when you look at HAVA as an example, HAVA is an operational security document which has aspects of cybersecurity in it. It's how to manage and run an election in a valid way to ensure that the count or the vote is tabulated correctly. Whether it's attacked or whether it's failing or whatever, it's determined to be an operational security or resiliency matter. And so the, the expertise I have in particular is I'm a national expert recognized in this area of how to fit cybersecurity and operational security together. I developed the expertise. One of my first experiences was with banks. Uh, next experience was with HAVA, writing HAVA. So a lot of the words in the HAVA voluntary voter guidelines are my words. So it's, uh, it's still, even now, the, the, the uh, error uh, factor, or the allowed error rate on the machines was one that I suggested directly. So, it, you know, my words are still in HAVA. So the intent and the meaning and the purpose of HAVA is very well understood by me. All right, sir. <clears throat> and are there... Um... What is the, maybe you could summarize for the committee what the HAVA operational process requirements are for election uh, systems. So if you look at HAVA from a high level and you have to also combine it with, you know, the Help America Vote Act, HAVA, also subsumes the National Voter Registration Act or NIVRA. So they both work together. HAVA directly refers and, and incorporates NIVRA into its uh, conceptualization. So you have three parts. You have the act of HAVA. You have the National Voter Registration Act itself uh, subsumed by reference. And then you have the voter uh, guidelines, which there have been several versions of that. The one that establishes the error rate is the, is the 2002 version. Uh, but the rest has been, you know, changed over time, recognizing, you know, improvements or deficiencies, uh, solutions to the deficiencies that needed to be undertaken. So there have been a number of revisions over the years. But the fact of the matter is, if you look at HAVA as a whole, it talks about, uh, including the parts, it talks about uh, three primary things, the voter, uh, the creation of a ballot or the vote, and then the tabulation of the vote. And then in between those process items, there is a connection, it's called chain of custody, the transfer of the information from the uh, 
registration validation process to the ballot submission process to the ballot tabulation process. Then there are two bodies of governing rules around it. The first body on the left is the body of policy procedures, state law, uh, implementation of federal precedents and guidance, and then obviously the U.S. Constitution as well. On the right side, if you, if you think about it as a picture, on the right side, you have the auditable items requirement. There's very specific requirements in HAVA to maintain all of the auditable items. The reason is because the risk management framework dictates this type of design. So FISMA was actually incorporated into the design of HAVA from the beginning, origin, the original FISMA, not the, uh, you know, it, again, because my association with that predates the actual authorship, authorship of, uh, of what you would call FISMA at this point. So those design, what's called the risk management framework, was used, it wasn't called that at the time, but it was used in the design of HAVA, which means that you have to have rules and process and operational procedures that govern the execution of a particular operation. And then on the other side, you have to have the ability to prove that the operation actually performed as you said it would. And in between, you have the operational steps associated with primary operational targets, that being knowing whether the voter is a voter, uh, controlling the execution of a ballot and then submission of that ballot for tabulation. And so the, the original design was quite specific about, uh, you know, how to contain the operational security and validity of the elections, the original. Uh, it's unfortunately been debrided significantly since it was originally implemented. It's been what significantly? It's... It's been injured. <laughs> it's no longer intact. I mean, there's several aspects of the original implementation of AVA that are no longer intact. All righty. And I think you made reference at some point uh, to accuracy standards or requirements under HAVA. Can you tell us what those are? So there's a little bit of confusion in the in, in the world about this. The original HAVA implementation is the 2002 implementation. But when states become HAVA states, they may have to uh, comply with the 2002 implementation and the later implementation, some of which were one out of 125,000 ballots uh, being in error. So it established what the maximum number of errors in the system, the voting system, not the voting machines, the voting system were. So that's the end-to-end -end system? then that you're referring to? So it, 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 this particular issue, as far as I know, has never been clearly or, uh, or, you know, adjudicated. But the fact of the matter is it is talked about as a system that includes the software and the operation of the system, which would include all aspects of the operation, what's allowed in, what's allowed out, you know, how you audit it, you know, what's required to audit. I mean, the word auditable, means auditable that you can audit it so it, uh, uh, it it's quite it's quite extensive in that regard it was designed based on you know banking and and you know, uh, nsa standards that existed under you know that become the nist standards at the time right. which are you know less comprehensive than they are now but they were quite extensive even then all right, sir. And uh, what are the implications if voting systems are not auditable to the HAVA standards for auditability? They don't comply with the law. And does that uh, increase the uh, risk of... So in, under, the, under the risk management framework, auditability or provability is a requirement. And so when the CESA Act gets passed, it, it would be a natural assumption that the federal standard for designing uh, federally secure systems would apply. So the, the fact, again, is that this particular issue hasn't been clearly adjudicated. But the fact is that the operational system integrity, the validity of what's happening is governed by whether or not it 
everything that goes in is supposed to go in and nothing comes out that isn't supposed to come out and the and that you can prove it after the fact it's part of the risk management framework now officially it, it was unofficially part of the design fabric before it became an official part of it which happened in 2018 by the way so so the, you know the the fact is that if anything fails in the system, it's no longer considered a sound system. Under FISMA, when you have a violation of the operational security map and the risk assessment, so, so you have to understand that the beginning point is the risk assessment. You take all the assumptions about how something's going to work and you build it into your operational rules. You build it into the system maintenance and management and operation and you build it into the monitoring process that is acknowledged even in the CISA website, if you read it today, that the thing has to be monitored. This is about auditability that's required in HAVA. So the monitoring has to be complete, or at least has to meet the same guidelines as when the system was designed. And so when you have a failure of an audit item, like a batch ticket that's supposed to be able to be uh, compared on a precinct ballot count by batch, this is a violation of the auditable item requirement. So what does that mean? It means that the system that was used had a higher risk than the system that was approved. Under federal rules, this means it has to be investigated. Someone has to look at what happened and figure out whether or not that risk uh, you know, created any sort of a problem? Was it reliable or not? The other issue that you've got in contention, is, which our elections are a, a place of natural contention between different parties of interest, one of the basic principles of our suffrage is associated with, you know, Federalist Paper Number 10, where we're talking about the fact that the system has to be trustworthy. So the trustworthiness is, a tr is essentially a treaty between warring parties. If you want to consider the Democrats and Republicans warring, warring parties, it's an agreement to hold peace based on the, the adherence to the law. This is common to all cyber systems, banking systems. You agree according to the terms of use to use that system. The, the terms of use are defined not just in the cyber world, it's defined in the operational aspect of how the vote is conducted. How, how is the election conducted? Jeremy, and so as soon as you have a risk variation, you have a brokenness in the system. It's no longer considered trustworthy against the contract. Uh, we call it contract. It's not a literal contract. It's an agreement between the parties that established the rules. So the party that's aggrieved in that Mr. has a right to worry about it. Howie Go ahead, please. wants to make an objection. Yeah, so we're, me... we're not proceeding by question and answer here. The question that started all this off was something like about what happens if the accuracy standard of HAVA is not met, and he said it doesn't apply, and then we got a lecture where I think we should proceed by question and answer. Uh, he asked for an elucidation, didn't he? I, maybe I misunderstood. I'm sorry. Mr. Harry, I, the, the, the problem isn't yours. It's how how we should structure this so it so it makes it's easier for us to understand what you're trying to say. Sure. And so I think it would help, Mr. McDougal, if you were to to get us this in smaller bites. I, I, I will. I will do that. Uh, I, the answer was so excellent. I decided not to interrupt. <laughs> I, I'll interrupt more. Um, the uh, I believe the question I asked you was, uh, what happens if the machine is not auditable? And I think you were just about to wrap up your answer on that. So uh, it doesn't comply with HAVA. Right. That's the answer. And the uh, I, I think you sort of said this, but in a bite sized answer, how does, for example, uh, chain of custody documentation requirements fit into that audibility? Uh, standard that you were just talking about? In the business, we call these trust anchors. It means that the trust anchors have been removed. The reason that you trust the system no longer exists. To properly adjudicate whether or not it's still trustworthy, someone has to investigate and resolve whatever the inconsistencies are created by the loss of the trust anchor. 
And so in an election in which a uh, chain of custody documentation for uh, over 100,000 absentee ballots was lost, uh, how would you characterize the uh, that election in terms of HAVA and the audibility requirements? Well, it's, in, it's invalid under the law. Objection. It doesn't mean it couldn't be cured. It's just invalid and it's un... Mr. Oh, sorry. Mr. Howley, uh, Mr. Fox wants to interpose an objection before you answer, and I and, right, and and uh, I don't know what the basis for the hypothetical. Is. Well, we've had testimony in the case that absentee ballots in Fulton County, in excess of a hundred thousand, if my memory serves, uh, lacked chain of custody documentation. Don't believe that was the, the, the right. well, I'll, I'll allow him to answer the question. And if it doesn't connect up with the evidence, it doesn't mm -hmm. connect up with the evidence. Yeah, I, I may be wrong about the exact number. Okay. Let's just say uh, a, a significant number of absentee ballots lacking chain of custody documentation. Uh, what does that mean for the that election under these HAVA standards that we've been discussing? Well, again, viewing HAVA and the whole system as a contract, it means that the terms of the contract have been violated. So the, the fact is that the, that the certification of compliance with the system requirements is invalid. Hmm. Under cyber rules and under operational security rules, I'm not rendering a legal opinion. I'm talking about the way a cybersecurity or operational security uh, system that's been approved or certified would be handled under federal law. And, and this, uh, go ahead. I was going to say, sticking with the example of missing chain of custody documents, is that a, uh, a situation in which further investigation would be warranted? Technically, if the risk is, if the risk of those uh, violations of process rules is sufficient to potentially alter the outcome, it would require some process of curing them. Curing would be an investigation and a decision that they were material or not material. Uh, but, but there has to be an investigation. You just can't say that, you know, and again, I, it's not about challenging the outcome of the election. It's about challenging whether the election was conducted, conducted according to law. If you look at the election prosecution guidance on election uh, crimes, it's clearly uh, an issue of concern, even from a criminal investigation perspective. You can't inject things that don't meet the letter of the law, but accepting a ballot that's not... Uh, valid under the law is considered election fraud oh, by the DOJ's own, own plain state. This is a legal opinion now. Yeah, yeah he, you are. The answer is going kind of a field and it is giving a legal. I'm sorry. So um, I'll sustain that objection. All right. Um, <clears throat> in the event that a ballot, an absentee ballot must have his signature verified in order to be counted, and there is an abandonment of signature verification uh, in an election, uh, how would that be treated under the HAVA requirements, uh, accuracy, audibility, and security that we've been talking about? Objection, there's no absence of basis for the hypothetical. Um, well, uh, so far as the objection is concerned, I would rule the same way, but I'm a little confused about that the witness talked about mandatory, you know, voluntary. You've used the term requirements, and I'm not quite sure what, which part, at what time you're referring to. Also, that there, 2002 version and 2018 versions. So, can you? Uh, well, let's uh, clarify I'll, the I'll question. I, 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 I can, I can try to explain. I, sorry, right, let me rephrase the question, and uh, we get it on a better footing. Uh, in the 2020 election, um, if it was established that in Fulton County, um, 146,029 absentee ballots were accepted without there being any signature verification as required by statute, 
uh, what would you say about that in terms of the HAVA requirements that we have been talking about? Objection to the absence of foundation for the hypothetical. Okay, uh, you know, that's it. Yeah. As it's the same ruling, really, you've just again used the term HAVA requirements we've been discussing, and I'm not sure which of the various things he's referred to are the HAVA requirements in your well, question. I, I think he can tell us uh, which ones were applicable in 2020. Applicable to Georgia? Yeah. Voluntarily or mandatorily or whatever? I think Mandatorily. He, I think he can help us with all of that, Mr. Chairman. All right. Unfortunately, there's very ambiguous titles to these instruments. Uh, there's the voluntary system guidelines, the voluntary voter uh, system guidelines or voting system guidelines. Uh, they're labeled voluntary, but they become mandatory under certain conditions. These guidelines were mandatory in Georgia in 2020. So even though I'm trying to use the proper title. It's very confusing to anybody that's never waded through it before. And, and so these two voluntary guidelines of certain part of the original voluntary standards in 2002 apply as a mandatory requirement. And all of the currently uh, valid or, or the current version of the voluntary voter system guidelines uh, apply as a mandatory requirement in Georgia in 2020. So they're all mandatory. <laughs> they just unfortunately are called voluntary in Georgia. All right, sir, and in the hypothetical that I posed to you, um, how does that square with the HAVA requirements that you just described? Again, going back to this left side of the drawing that I didn't show anybody, but I, I talked about it in, in a, a visual reference. The left side are the rules. And so these are the trust anchors associated with whether or not something can be used or not used. You also have the part of those rules are, are an establishment of what the voter identity requirements are. That can be voter ID in some states. It can be uh, a voter ID with picture in some states. It can be signature verification, it can be a rental receipt, all sorts of different things. But if that is violated, it's part of the system. It's part of the reason that you're allowed to trust the system. So negotiated between legislative interests in Georgia, where the implement and, and election commission interests in Georgia, uh, were the implementation of, of particular rules of conduct, they become law under the way HAVA works. So when you have HAVA compliant procedures and policy, they're legal requirements. Violation of those legal requirements are, are a violation of the trustworthiness of the system. It has to be under normal circumstances, and certainly 2020 was abnormal in many regards, but, but the fact of the matter is that the normal cybersecurity and operational security process would, would be to investigate whether it was possible for those uh, abrogations of, of uh, procedural requirements, whether it, it could have affected the election, not whether it did, but whether it could have. Again, this isn't about challenging the outcome. It's about whether or not uh, the, the process was intact. It wasn't intact. All right, sir. You had... Uh... Earlier, I asked you uh, kind of a familiarity question about this CISA Act, which I'm probably misnaming, uh, and how it ties into DOJ. Can you explain that for the committee? So, so CISA or CISA, depending on who you're talking to, uh, okay. is the organization that was put in place to guide federal agencies uh, in a single repository under the DHS uh, in terms of uh, how to implement secure federal systems. Their purview was expanded under the Infrastructure Act to non-government infrastructure as to how to secure non-government infrastructure. So CISA was given the purview 
but the federal standards for cybersecurity already existed. It didn't speak to, uh, you know, the fact that the federal standards are defined under FISMA, not under CISA. There are no standards in, in CISA. CISA just basically gives the authority uh, of, uh, you know, from an organizational or agency perspective to CISA under the DHS. They're responsible for all the government systems, the uh, you know, treasury and, and uh, you know, DHS systems, the, you know, TSA systems, all, all of them. So um, there is a kind of confused inter interface with the military and the, and the, you know, intelligence community, but, but basically the responsibility for the NIST standards that are incorporated into FISMA, which does apply to all of the agencies, including the intelligence com community and the DOD, is governed by FISMA and governed by those uh, standards that are incorporated in uh, into uh, FISMA. Uh, right. Specifically, it, it's called SP 853. So, how? Uh, so hold on one second, Mr. McDougall. We're now at, at five o'clock. Yes. Um, it, it can. Where are you? So I am, uh, I've probably got uh, 10 to 15 left with this witness. Um, and I'm happy to stop here or I'm happy to uh, press on as the, as it is the pleasure of the committee. Um, And I believe the witness is available Wednesday afternoon after lunch. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Actually, I probably will be open tomorrow morning as well. Yeah, we are not. Sad. We're not. We're not sitting tomorrow morning, but we're starting okay. at fifteen. Um, I'll certainly be available then. Um, all right. I think I'm going to. Uh, there are a couple one administrative thing I want to mention this afternoon, and I think we're better off picking up the end of the testimony tomorrow. I wouldn't ordinarily do that, but I know it's difficult to know whether 10 minutes becomes, you know. Uh, and so uh, at time estimates from the lectern are not very reliable. Right. So I yeah, mean, and that makes sense. The other thing is that sometimes when people have more time, it becomes shorter to, you know, if I had more time, I would have written a shorter uh, letter. One of my favorite things. Yes. <laughs> so, um, so in any event, why don't we uh, pause the testimony? Let me just raise the administrative question. Um, for our scheduling purposes, I had mentioned that we would like to have oral argument on the violation segment before we follow the rule and considering the, the, where we are on, on, on potential viol finding violation. I'm trying to figure out when that happens and when we ought to be doing our consideration to fit it into a schedule. Um, any idea, um, uh, um, first of all, uh, Mr. Fox, you're not expecting to put on uh, rebuttal witnesses or might you? No. Okay. So that obviously figures into part of the schedule. Um, any, and I'm not holding you to it, I'm just trying to schedule. Any idea, are, we, are you anticipating using all day tomorrow, or are we going to hit a point at like three o'clock that we're done with that everybody's rested or somewhere in between? Any sense? Uh, I would say it depends on how long my, how accurate my 15 minute estimate is, and then how long the Very cross close. goes. But I think that um, based on what I think I know now, that we will be finished with our evidence uh, tomorrow afternoon, although exactly when tomorrow afternoon, I couldn't say. Um, you know, I'll get ready um, in case we have close yeah, that's, tomorrow. That's... Um, but if there's a, if we could, if we hold closing until Thursday morning, I would be even more ready. Okay. <laughs> I, I, that's part of my reason, because if we're going to have argument tomorrow, I wanted to give you warning so you could prepare for it is really right. the concern. And, you know, we have to build in our time right. to, to do this. And um, so, okay. Um, all right. We will work with that. And uh, 
uh, Mr. Fox, do you have any sense? I know it's hard in cross-examination because you don't know what answers you're going to get to, but do you have a sense of how long, and, and Mr. Howery is not done with his direct, so there could be a million things in the last 10 minutes, but any sense of how long you're going to be with Mr. Smith and how, and, and, uh, need for Mr. Howery. And there's also Mr. Schaefer is going to testify tomorrow. We're, we're still thinking about that. Okay. So it might be that you won't call Mr. Schaefer. That's possible. Okay. And, and those are the last two witnesses, this gentleman, Mr. Smith. Um, I, I don't think we'll be long uh, on cross. Um, I, and, and I've actually prepared the closing so we can certainly do it. Um, uh, but, um, um, I have to say, I, te I, I tend to think it that much as Mr. McDougall hates it when I agree with him that uh, <laughs> uh, that that is his suggestion that we do it Thursday morning makes a lot of sense. Although I'm I'm certainly prepared to do it tomorrow. Well, I mean, here's part of the process from our standpoint. Um, the rule says make a preliminary non-binding determination. That's what the rule says, and and I truly think that's an oxymoron. Okay, I you know I'll I'll be honest with you. It determine if if it's preliminary and non-binding, it isn't a determination. It's something. It's an indication. It's a it's a. I, I it's noticed a, that also. <laughs> yeah, it's it's what we're thinking at this point. Okay, and it's subject to getting briefs, reviewing the whole record, evaluating it, and it is. I mean, at least the preliminary and non-binding makes it clear that it's subject to change. So. But we have we have to do that, and we have to do that, you know, as a committee together talking about it. Okay, my plan is to try to use our our time effectively, um, and um, I will try to use our time as effectively as we can so that we can be prepared to do that on a schedule that works with with what you know what you're doing. Um, what I am anticipating because I'm just going out, what could the schedule be? If we were to make a preliminary non-binding determination of at least one possible violation, we would then hear what people wanted to put in so far as evidence on, you know, positions and evidence on sanction. And I would actually anticipate if we went to such a proceeding that we would also want to have an argument on sanction, that I'd want to hear why, why, Disciplinary counsel believes the sanction is appropriate and why, why, you know, I assume Mr. Clark would disagree and we have that too. So that's what I'm expecting. And so I'm trying to work it into the schedule. And honestly, what I'll try to do is use Wednesday evening as effectively as we can in the perfect world. We would already have the argument and we're essentially recessing and using Wednesday afternoon so we can come in Thursday with, you know, some indication to people. Um, if the argument is not started or not done, I still will want to use Wednesday effectively to figure out what we need to know in order to make it so we can make, you know, I'll give you a high sign and you're not sitting here twiddling your thumbs for a long time. In, in, in. Right. So um, on that, I, I would be opposed to splitting the argument between sessions. Yeah, if you want to go to, together, you don't want to have just one side's argument and then the other. Yeah, I don't want to end with his peroration uh, at the end of the day, bang the gavel, um, and without hearing from me. So uh, I assume he's going to go first, right? And, yes, I mean it's their burden of proof. Right? He'll he'll go first, and and, and he gets you know, to open and close, right? Yeah, open and close um, is what what I would anticipate. But uh, you know, honestly, we want. We want to hear, we want to understand what mm -hmm. the positions are. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, so we'll try to figure this out. And if it looks like there time, there's time, you know, ought to be prepared tomorrow in case, in case we, we get there. If we don't get there or it doesn't look like we can get there, we'll work with having it on mm -hmm. Thursday. But I, you know, I want to make. I don't want to have a lot of dead time, you know, for I, I, all of I this. agree, and I apologize to the committee for the uh, my juggling of witnesses uh, didn't come off quite as smoothly this afternoon as I had hoped. I understand. All right. Well, with that, I think we're in recess. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And see you all at nine thirty tomorrow. Uh, we, uh, at one fifteen tomorrow morning. One fifteen on uh, tomorrow afternoon. Tomorrow.
Yes, 115 is tomorrow. Thank you, Mr. Howard. All right, thank you, Mr. Howard.